Hello, and welcome everybody to another episode of Pod Strickland. I'm your host, Shwini Poo, and this is episode 243. I am joined on a unfortunately early end to the day nowadays on a Tuesday. I'm joined by my co-host Stacy. That is at Stacy Pan eighty nine. Stacy, how are you doing? Doing pretty well. Uh, got my I voted sticker right here, so feeling pretty uh, nice. pretty self righteous right now. That is good. Uh, I have an idea of who you voted for, and I'm assuming you sent your absentee ballot into Florida for Ron DeSantis. Um... That's correct. <laughs> and one to Georgia for Herschel Walker, man. <laughs> Running backs do matter. Yes, exactly. Uh, we are joined, uh, not by a first-time guest, but actually not even first time in a long time. He's been on pretty recently. He's on on the rundown also uh, after every game. His name is Jeffrey Rasmussen. You know him as at Frank Barrett 119 on Twitter. For Jeff, I was about to say Frank. Jeff, how are you? I'm good. Uh, I was recently told on a spaces that I have to just drop it entirely. Like I just need to, I just need to embrace my name and be done with Frank. Let, let him go. You know, I don't know if I can do that. That would hurt my heart too much, but I don't know. I've been debating it. The same guy also told me I sound like a frozen character. So, you know, I don't know what you take, you take what you can get, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, uh, Frank is, he's back. He's active. Uh, he's going to start getting some minutes soon, I would think. So you don't have to quit him. You just you can always keep him in your heart. Uh, but before we get started, I do have to announce that Strickland has a Patreon. You can subscribe to it. There are a number of tiers. There is a six dollar tier that gets you access to Pod Strickland. That I do every Friday with Prez. You also get access to the Doug Bag, Andrew Steele, aka Doug, his mailbag that he hosts with. Dallas Amico, friend of the pod, and writer, staff member of the Strickland. You also get access to the Strickland Discord, where the conversation never stops. There are further tiers. There's a $9 tier that gets you access to Strickland Roll, my solo pod, where I rant and rave about the Knicks even more. But far more importantly, you get access to wonderful weekly articles by Jack Huntley and Matthew Miranda, two of the best in the business. And sometimes you even get a premium article from Jeffrey Rasmussen right here. There are further tiers. There's a $15 tier, $30 tier, $50 tier, and $100 tier. Those come with a variety of additional benefits like listening in on pod recordings, merchandise discounts, and even potentially co-hosting a podcast alongside yours truly one day, whether you choose to subscribe or not. None of this would be possible without you. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, the Knicks won a basketball game. They won a basketball game against the Minnesota Timberwolves, who look absolutely miserable. And I don't just more mean- like... Sheep's and wolves' clothing, you know. Wow. Sheep and wolves' clothing. That is it. Sheep's. It's sheep. <sighs> okay, we're just gonna move on. That was terrible. I hate you. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think it is. Yeah, it's a sheep and wolves' clothing, right? Yeah. Yeah, and they were supposed to have a, a seven foot wolf, seven foot three who didn't play. They're supposed to have. Uh, well, maybe a cat in wolf's clothing. I don't know, but I think that's an appropriate analogy. Fuck you, Shwin. I'm staying with it. Oh, my God. This is just going off the rails real quick here. Uh, yeah, they look terrible, but the Knicks made them look terrible to some degree. Uh, and it was a nice bounce back after what was kind of like a weird weekend of games. They beat Philly in a game that was kind of... It was, I don't know. We'll, we'll talk about it. It was a weird game. Uh, they won 108 106. And then they lost to Boston the next night on Saturday night uh, in what was a shootout, 133 uh, 118. Closer than the final score indicates and actually kind of encouraging, I thought. Anyway, we will talk about all of it. Uh, but I want to start with this game. This was, I thought, in a lot of ways, the Knicks' most complete effort for 48 minutes, I think, so far. Uh, We will talk about the Randall of it all, but like, yes, Randall was super on fire from three. He went eight of 13 from three, 31 points on, I want to say 15 shots. I don't have the box corner in front of me, Uh, but everybody chipped in. It was a very, very all around team effort. I would honestly say other than, than Rose, pretty much everybody seemed to Evan. Evan wasn't terrible last night. He wasn't good, but he wasn't completely terrible. Uh, 
you wouldn't know that if you'd read my tweets during the game uh, because Evan's mistakes are the worst mistakes ever. But I thought overall he was okay in his minutes. Uh, nothing to write home about or anything. Nothing that changes my position on him, but he was okay. But everybody else I thought had a pretty good game, even Randall. Um, you know, yes, the offensive approach doesn't fill me with uh, optimism that it is, it is sustainable, but I thought overall he was fine. He was pretty solid. Uh, I mean, obviously you'll take the shooting as it is, but, uh, you know, the decision-making on offense was a perfect, was a great, no, but it's better than what we had seen the previous couple of games, I think. Uh, defensively, he was at least a little bit more with it, and especially in the second half. The first half was still really bad. Um, I don't want to harp too much on this. We'll talk about him in a little bit. I thought RJ had continued his solid play. Cam, as a starter, has been... I mean, the most kind thing I can say about him is that he has helped fill in the gap uh, in that lineup and help make it work. Uh, Brunson was great. I thought quickly was really solid off the bench. Obi was, I thought, really, again, really, really good off the bench. Also nice to see him close the game out uh, next to Randall at the four and the five. Another thing we'll talk about later. Uh, and, you know, I, I just thought, I, th I liked what Sims gave us last night. I thought he played with good energy. I thought Hartenstein had one of his best games. Um, and yeah, I just thought it was like a really nice team effort. Kind of a, a it wasn't a wire to wire victory, but may as well have been. And um, yeah, this thing was, you know, they got it to like what thirteen, I think, at one point in the fourth quarter. Knicks hit two threes, and that was that. It was over after that point. So, uh, really fun game in that sense. And uh, I'm just curious to get your guys' thoughts on it. I had some. The one, the only like there was like probably two notable things I thought from this in terms of rotation stuff thought it was notable that rose didn't just come in first but then at the end of the first half when brunson got into foul trouble he came back in didn't like that don't love that i think that should be quickly's kind of thing there and then um again he went with he went with obi and randall to close i know he didn't have mitch but he could have gone back to sims he could have stuck with hartenstein could have done a lot of, he could have done a few things but he went with that and we'll see if it if it if he keeps with it, uh, even when he has a full set of options at the center spot, but it's got to be, it is definitely somewhat encouraging that he is now closed with this in two of the last three games, uh, including that Philly one where it was super effective. Um, and I guess, I guess additional third one, third thing to note would be like, I'm just going to throw, you know, let's just, this is probably the best place to start this because I haven't seen a lot of people talk about this. We've talked a lot about Julius Randle. We've talked a lot about Evan Fournier. We've talked a lot about should IQ start, should Brandon start, should Grimes start, whatever. Are we sure Mitch should start? Because I'm not sure anymore if Mitch should start. I don't think this lineup works as well offensively with Mitch in it. And Who would you start in his place? I'm fine with doing a mix and match thing. Like I liked, I was a little bit surprised that he started Sims, but I also didn't hate it. And I thought this was a good match. This is a better matchup for Sims to start the game than it was for Hartenstein. I think there will be other matchups where maybe you'd rather have Hartenstein start, but I, I don't think it needs to be set in stone, but like no, I, I, the reason I, the, it is yeah, the reason I asked that is because I don't think there's a chance in hell that when Mitch is back, Mitch isn't the starter. And I'm not sure. I, it's a very small sample. I know that what he's out for seven to 10 days. I think they said, we'll see how accurate that is. But like, I mean, we've seen, two and a half games basically right where Mitch is out because he was, didn't play the second half against Philly. I don't think uh, the offensive returns on that are good. And I think the defense, like, yes, the rotations against Boston were a mess, but that wasn't about, it's not like they took advantage of Mitch not being there. You know what I mean? I think those rotation fuck ups were about the other four guys on the floor. So I guess my that that's my question. Like, are we sure that Mitch is the best starter at the center spot for this team? Assuming the rest of the starting lineup is going to be what it is, which is Jalen, Jalen Brunson, RJ, Cam, Randall. Uh, I'll let uh, Jeff take a shot at that first. I think they should definitely go back to Mitch to start. Um, I think that. 
he should at least be given a chance to see how he does with this iteration of the starting lineup. I know his his impact numbers right now are really bad. They're like actually pretty close to Fournier's, but I'd be willing to bet that you can tie a lot of his minutes to Fournier. And we have enough evidence over the span of his career to know that he's a good, impactful player. I'm extremely sympathetic to the concerns you raised. I think the offensive ceiling is definitely lower um, with Mitch, with that group, as opposed to Hartenstein or Obi. But at the same time, I do think he is the ultimate defensive stabilizer. And even though I strongly believe that Cam's presence helps RJ's defense a lot, and the two of them as a tandem are really actually really solid defensively, um, and the numbers bear that out really well, um, I still think that you need that presence on the inside. It's, it's a lot closer than I would have thought before the start of the season. Um, I remember actually saying before the start of the season that I was going to be annoyed when the bench played really well and the starters struggled and people's immediate jump to conclusion was, oh, Hartenstein's better than Mitch. And I personally believe there's a pretty meaningful gap between the two of them. But Mitch is a flawed player. And unless the Randall shooting is real, those spacing issues will always be prevalent. So I'm more open to the idea that that's eventually where we're going to have to go. But I think that Mitch deserves a chance to play with Cam, RJ, Brunson, and Randall and at least see how that goes. Yeah, um, I agree. I, look, I agree. I don't have a problem with them going back to him. I'm more just thinking long term out of the box. And the reason why I think it's an important question that the Knicks not just answer, but like, you know, look, like we've seen Tibbs, you know, when he decides something is what it should be, there's often not a lot of give. He's shown a little bit more flexibility this year. But I bring that up. We know that he likes Mitch a lot, and we know that he loves his center being an elite rim protector and that he values that over whatever they bring offensively. Um, so the reason why I think it's important that Knicks really consider this is if Mitch isn't this, none of this is to say Mitch is a bad player. Mitch is a good player, but if he's not going to start for you and if you are going, like, even if it's Obi, right? Like there's still going to be some clunkiness to that inherently just because of how limited Mitch is offensively. And so like, if he's not going to start for you, then now do you consider like, okay, maybe he's part of a package to upgrade at a different position. Uh, I, I'm not saying I, I don't have a specific person, player, whatever in mind, but like, you know, Mitch's salary plus Evan's salary this year and next kind of gets you to about, 33 36 million like that's a chunk of change that puts you in the range of players who could potentially be serious difference makers for you in other slots of your rotation i think that's something the knicks really need to consider especially because like look i know and it's a very small sample size obviously but like i've been encouraged by what i've seen from hartenstein over the course of the season what i've kind of recognized is that the things that he does poorly are just the things that absolutely kill me so much so i i'm like over the top in terms of being critical of him but he's a really good player and i like what he brings offensively there's a versatility and diversity to what he provides i would love if he learned how to box out that would be fantastic but like overall i think you're you're seeing exactly why he got the contract he got and why that was viewed as this is a bargain this is a value signing um he's shown a lot for me not just the last few games without Mitch, but over the course of the season, I think he's shown a lot. Um, so I, I pretty much completely disagree with most of it. Um, first of all, I, I want to say besides maybe quickly and cam Mitch, like from the people who detract him is probably the most underrated player in the most obscene ways. The people who hate Mitch are basically like, well, we need a post bucket. We need Jalen Durant. We need, 
you know, like it's it's fucking ridiculous the kind of hate that Mitch gets. Let's be real, this team sucks ass at rebounding. They don't have any good re- the next best who do who do you think is the next best rebounder after Mitchell Robinson on the Knicks? I'll give you an answer. Quickly. It's yeah, quick. he is the second best rebounder on the Knicks, which is both yes, an endorsement of Emmanuel quickly, and also a complete destruction. So like, don't give me all this bullshit about Randall and Obi and all they're fucking terrible rebounders. All right. And Mitch is an amazing rebounder. He's an elite rim protector. Um, and the offense worked pretty well early on. When Randall was doing when Randall was doing his job, don't shake your head. When Randall was I'm gonna look, shake look, my head, I'm gonna look don't, don't shake my head. head. Listen to the whole thing. <laughs> So I'm that you just, can hear what I'm saying. I'm, this is I'm my cousin Vinny quote, baby. I just reacting. I just posted it. I'm I'm in the zone. But um the point I'm making is that like Mitch out of that dunker spot, yeah, he sets terrible screens. I don't think he's as much of a limiting factor on offense as you're intuiting, as you're saying. I will po- I will pose this. If they were to start Obi with Randall and Cam next to RJ, I wouldn't hate it because I posted a thread about this and to me, if that becomes a switch everything lineup, that would kind of irrelevant to uh, to Mitch would kind of help a couple of the things the Knicks are struggling with. As much as the rebounding has been an issue, the bigger issue against in the games they've lost is denying three pointers. Um, I think if they can switch everything, that you know they don't have room protection, but if you have RJ six seven six ten wingspan Cam. Six eight seven one wingspan, Ob six nine seven two wingspan, Randall six nine seven foot wingspan. You have all of those guys. They they might not have resistance at the rim, but they have to go through a hell of a lot to get there. And anecdotally, I feel like Randall has been more engaged when he's been in that lineup. I don't know if you guys would agree with this, but I think like he's with, with Cam and in RJ? that small ball lineup yesterday. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, I saw yeah. Randall closing out pretty hard on. Th- I know low bar. We don't have this is not a shit on Randall thing, but like that's that is to me meaningful because it seems like he's more engaged. So I would I can hear the reasoning from that end, but I'm not starting Isaiah Hartenstein over Mitch. Period. Like, um, I don't like first of all, a Randall Hartenstein front line is going to get pummeled on the glass. I don't trust the foot speed on defense at all. Um and but I don't think I don't think the def like what has Mitch um Mitch has not proven anything this year. He's been a disappointment this year, if we're going to be honest. Yeah, he's done that behind, like, that's like saying if your safety is Troy Polamalu, but your corners are, like, fucking no, that, awful. No, it's not, it's not the same thing. Rush, it's, not, it's like, it's not well, the Troy thing. Polamalu isn't saving it's not the, the whole thing. fucking team from no, it's being not the same ass. Thing. It's like, not yeah, the same what do you thing. want Mitch to do? I want like, Mitch they, to not, I want play, Mitch, I want Mitch would, to not commit 30th. stupid fouls. It would be the worst I want Mitch to not commit league. stupid fouls. I want okay, him to not. I want, I want, I want when, still, even I want with those when fouls, he's defending. Hold on, hold on. I want better than Hardenstein with the fouls. Hold on, hold on. I want him. We're not, Isaiah Hardenstein's getting paid $9 million a year. He's got two years. We're talking 15, about who should start. Though. We're not talking about if Mitchell Robinson. Mitchell Robinson wants to be a starting center. Fine. Then he needs to fucking. He needs to like value his own minutes. Then because the way he's played is like a fucking asshole. Okay, so that's this, a separate issue from no. It's not. Start, it's though. not the same. Whether not, he should start. To me, it is. It is. It is. It is part of the same issue because if I can never develop any type of consistency with you because you can't stay on the floor, and I'm not talking about injuries. I'm not worried about the injuries. I think most of that stuff is freaky whatever like he's he jumps high and lands in weird places it's gonna happen i'm not that worried about that but like when i like we're playing the Cavs, okay he's got one foul already we're about six minutes in the first quarter why are you trying to reach over robin lopez when he's getting the ball on an inbounds pass 20 feet from the rim what do you do and this is like that's just one instance of him committing a stupid foul but but how is, many times has he been put in bad positions because they? That's the job. Starting that's four, the but job. They, but there's no. If, you don't have to start. If, if you're an elite, if you're an elite one. defensive center, then you need to be an elite defensive center. Yes, Evan Fournier sucks ass on defense. So does yes. Brunson. Like Brunson yes. can't okay, keep they, dudes in front of him. But we're and not. RJ but those, is an ass too. And Randall, okay, but okay, they're Randall. going to be there, dude. So he's covering like, up RJ is going to start. RJ is going to start. Brunson's going to start. These are facts of life. Okay, these are just the facts of life. I don't care. We can sit here and debate. Yes, I agree. They're not doing the best job possible. Well, they're putting Mitch in terrible but that's positions. the reality. That's so Mitch the has to be better. And if he's not going to – if he can't stick on the floor and be an elite defensive player, while I disagree with you that the idea that he's not a big deal offensively, I think that's, we have 
four, three plus years now of evidence that him and Julius Randle, and again, we, we have a half of that equation and, is not Mitch. This is my point, though. It doesn't matter. We're not trading Julius Randle right now. He's going to be here. So yeah, in this current and match version of the Mitch. team, as the team exists right now, we have three plus years of evidence that show Mitchell Robinson and Julius Randle do not work. It's just, that is a fact. You can do go. You think every the Knicks are a better offensive team or a defensive team? Do I think the Knicks are a better offensive team or a defensive team? I'll tell you this. I I thought for sure it was going to be defense. I've been pretty impressed with how they've looked offensively. Right. Without Mitch. I've been pretty impressed with how they looked with Mitch, but they're ass on defense. They are ass on defense right now. That's not that's just a fact. And that's I mean, that's mostly Fournier. But it's also that Randall's very inconsistent. Um, if you know, if if you if you showed me that they could play four perimeter defenders that could just stop penetration, I would probably be more willing to listen to arguments that Hartenstein could start. Um, I, like I said, I'm okay with Obi starting because it would be something different and unconventional, and it would give you that plus on um, a on offense because Obi's been shooting the lights out. That's a big difference in him, him and Hartenstein too, by the way. I, I'm buying OB shooting. Um, and the other thing is that you have that mobility. But if you're not adding mobility and you, like, you're like you just relying on someone to like be both your best... Re- like Think about how hard that is, right? To be an elite rim protector and to be dominate the glass because you have to choose one or the other. And like Jaren... Like, uh, not Jaren Jackson. Jaren Jackson obviously is in this bucket, but Miles Turner, horrible rebounder because he's always chasing the blocks. Mitch can actually do both of those things. Um, but, you know, he doesn't have post moves. So, you know, he doesn't play like Rick Smith. So he must suck. No, but you see, like, you always turn into this fucking post moves thing. That's not, he's not, he doesn't do anything on offense, period. He's not good at screen setting. He, he's a great uh, he offensive has, rebounder. And, he, like, you he, get, you're minimizing his offensive rebound. No, I'm not. I'm, that's, he does one thing really well on offense. He's a great offensive rebounder. His and when he ver- slips, his, he's still a lob threat. That's like, that's lob, not nothing. That's like, you're talking about, like, maybe. Maybe you're talking about like three possessions a game. Like, I'm sorry, this lob oh, a great... no, we're doing more of that than with how many lobs a game in. does Mitchell Robinson get? Because no, it's not just the lobs for it's like it's like running a read option in football, it's not how many times the QB yeah. runs it. I'm sorry, it's I, how I many think this times it keeps the defensive he's, end. This he's like his his offensive, like, so you're the, you're gra- the vertical the idea of gravity. gravity thing, That's like saying steps three minimized. pointers are the only time when he's affecting defense, which is obviously not true. Like, there, there's clearly times when like guys like you know, Looney or whatever, get a, a free run to the rim because Steph's three-point gravity. You have a similar thing with Mitch going to the rim. Like, a lot of those Brunson and quickly floaters are Are you kidding me? You, did you just compare Mitchell Robinson's gravity no, and I some didn't. capacity to no, Steph No, I'm saying that gravity? if you're going to just dismiss it, it's I, I just I am going to dismiss it that. because you're not, you're not letting me finish. You, you're, I'm going to dismiss it because part of having vertical gravity involves you actually screening. It it that it involves that it's not just slipping the screen and like no, he, it involves actually setting contact on the screen. It involves actually having a cadence with your ball handler and creating and keeping open that passing, that passing angle, passing lane, and not just always going for the lob, not just always sprinting to the front of the rim, not always diving as fast as you can without looking anywhere. It involves being a threat to catch the ball in the short roll and being able to do anything, something with it. Like, he does nothing on offense with the ball in his hands. And I'm not talking about post moves. I don't give a shit about post moves. Set a screen. Do something and dribble handoff. He can't do any of that because he will never put his body into a screen. And somehow, we're in year five of this, and he still can't do it. He still right, won't but, do it. But you like, have these to are massive. The other if options. you're going to be, If you're going to be a low-usage rim-running center, you better be a good screener. And he is one of the worst, if not the worst be a great in the NBA. Defensive player and elite rebounder. And your backups shouldn't, like, okay, Isaiah Hardenstein can set a screen. Is that max, is that taking the Knicks offense to, to extremely high levels compared I, to what you give up on defense? It to a higher level. To, I would give, I give you that with Obi. If you're going to start Obi, then fine, I'll bench Mitch. I'm not benching Mitch for Isaiah Hardenstein. Because that's just an offense move, and you give up a ton on defense. I'm sorry, you've mentioned this yourself. Isaiah Hardenstein has to play drop, and he has to play, you know, not even Brooke Lopez drop. He has to play like Kevin Love drop. To me, so. he's looked a lot better doing it over the last few games. Uh, maybe it's just a blip. Maybe he's getting used to the scheme. I mean, he's I don't know. good. He is good once, like, 
if they're not pulling up for three from him, if he doesn't have to do anything on the perimeter, he's great in the paint. Like his lateral mobility there is good. He's had some good blocks. I, I, I am a fan of the Isaiah Hartenstein signing, but it's like we get killed on the glass. We, you know, we lack that perimeter mobility. And um, I mean, if the argument is Mitch needs to commit fewer fouls, yeah, but that's an argument that Mitch needs to stay on the floor more, right? So, but like, can he? And if he can, look, if I'm, he can, I'm gonna shut up. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna let, I'm gonna let you go because I've talked a lot. I just fundamentally cannot believe the idea. Like, uh, Mitch is to me this year. I I picked him. You can go check our preseason roundtable thing that we did. I kind of facetiously picked him as the MVP. I, it, it was Brunson, but like I picked him because everybody else is saying Brunson. Um, he's been super disappointing. Again, like, again, he's been super disappointing. And it's every year there's something, oh, well, he couldn't stay on the floor because the perimeter defense is bad. Oh, he's coming back from injury. Oh, at what point are we just like, okay, can he just hold his own? Like, we're playing the Cavs. He's going up against Jared Allen, Evan Mobley. He's got to stay on the floor. Couldn't do it. Against Giannis, he made this big, sh- you know, this huge fucking thing. Oh, I want the challenge. I want the challenge taken. him. What did he do? He couldn't stay on the floor. Again, is it a crime to not stay on the floor against Giannis? No. But at some point, if you're an elite defensive center, that involves being elite in all kinds of circumstances, in if, unideal circumstances. Hardenstein, next can Hardenstein to bad guard Giannis defenders. without getting into, into foul trouble? Sorry, say that again? Can Hartenstein guard... Uh, Giannis without getting into foul trouble. Can Hartenstein do something offensively that elevates your That's group? not what I asked. But that's... But you admit there's a massive defense on the glass. Can Mitch? Okay, so can we... But you... Can you agree at least that there's a massive dif- difference on the glass and on defense? Can we agree on that or no? Uh, on the glass, for sure. On defense, from what I've seen, sure. I don't think it's as much as you're making it, though. So, but if we were to agree on that, would you still say the offensive difference is that much? That's the argument. I, I think it's to, worth considering. Yes, I think OB it's worth considering. Point. I think I've seen enough that I think it is worth considering. Ask the question. I don't think it's a bad. I don't think it's unreasonable. Mitch is not. He's not proven anything to me to be like, oh my god, we can't even. You know, we we could never bench Mitch. Like if you why? Feel like that, I would just start Obi. That's how I feel. I, and I'm not opposed I'd be fine to with that, that argument. I would be fine I wouldn't with start Hardenstein. I'm just saying, I just think, like... And I wouldn't start point... Hardenstein, Fournier, Brunson together defending pick and rolls makes you want to vomit. So, no, I wouldn't yes. do that. But Fournier's, OB, I think I can Fournier's see that. Fournier's dumb, Stacey. Like, Fournier yeah, is not... Fournier's not starting. Uh, you don't think he's going to start again? No. Ever. Never no. again. He's okay, never so what... Oh, well, Frank... Uh, Jeff, sorry. <laughs> You didn't get a chance, to call, <laughs> but I do. I'm also interested because I think you mentioned this one, which is a departure from your previous stance that Cam should be starting even when Grimes is healthy. But Jeff, still, uh, me and Schwinney just had Yelled a at battle each other. royale for, <laughs> on the Mitch front. So I definitely interested in your thoughts there. And then, yeah, how it might uh, impact or how that might change how you look at the rest of the starting lineup. To, to be fair, we haven't argued about Mitch in a while, so we had to get that out. We had to I scratch wanna, that, just, Mitch. <laughs> I just want to say that I think the numbers are really like the, the lineup data is really interesting because it kind of um, not kind of, it just does. It supports both of the arguments that you guys are each making, which is really funny. Um, So let's start with Mitch versus Hardenstein defensively. So Hardenstein's actually played more minutes with the starters, but Cam and Fournier's spot and still they are almost 10 points worse defensively per 100 with Cam and Fournier's spot with 125 defensive rating. He's played 32 minutes with the actual with the with the opening night starting lineup with Fournier, Randall, Brunson, and Barrett, and then Hardenstein. And their defensive rating is 25 points worse per hundred. So, like, I mean, I know it's small sample sizes, but I don't think there's any reasonable argument that the 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 gap between Hartenstein and Mitch isn't enormous defensively. But at the same time, um, the net rating with the opening night starting lineup is only two points worse because the offense also gets 20 points better per 100. And then when you throw Cam in with RJ, Brunson, Randall, and Hartenstein – they have a positive net rating, plus 6.3, and uh, yeah, the offense is still way better. So 
clearly you're getting something with Hartenstein and clearly you're giving up something by losing Mitch. And these numbers, plus hearing you guys both kind of, in my opinion, very well def- or do a very good job of defending your stances. I just think that it makes me kind of more entrenched in my point of view that Mitch should just get a chance with Cam as the wing because if the lineup data with Hartenstein plus the opening and night starters is only slightly worse, but you're seeing a huge gap on both sides of the ball, they're just, you know, it's just a little bit better with Mitch on the whole. I would be really interested to see what, if it's sort of a similar trend with Cam in the starting lineup and then with Mitch back. And I think that you don't have to give him a long leash. Like, I think that if he comes back and they just revert to, you know, how the starters were the last two seasons, I tend to lean closer to Stacy than Schwinn as far as Mitch's overall impact. I'm on record saying that I think that from a volume perspective, I think Mitch was the Knicks' most valuable player last season. Um, but I think you really have to consider making a change. My vote would be, like Stacy said, just fuck it, go all in, and just try Obi and Randall together. But even if you're not willing to do that, I think if the the offense reverts to struggling really hard and the defense is just middle of the pack, you have to at least consider trying Hardenstein and just seeing if that really is just like such a big offensive difference that it's worth that it's worth seeding some defense. Uh, all right. Before we continue, I do have to make an announcement that here we go. NFL Sundays are only getting better. Not sure I agree with that. And so are the incredible offers at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Right now, new customers can bet just $5 on any NFL team to win and get $200 in free bets if they do. Check this out. Right now, everyone can earn up to a 100% boost with DraftKings stepped-up same-game parlays. Go to the DraftKings Sportsbook app, place a same-game parlay, and combine multiple bets like which team will win, player props, and point totals. With payouts bigger than ever, DraftKings Sportsbook is my go-to when betting on the NFL. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code THPN and place a $5 pregame money line bet to get $200 in free bets if your team wins. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL with code THPN. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. Um, I would like, I look, I, it's all very, we got to be, you know, cards on the table, all that bullshit, right? Hardenstein's played 255 minutes. Mitch has played 174. The Knicks as a team have played, whatever, nine times 48. I don't feel like doing the math right now. Uh, that's like, what, 330, something like that? I don't know, whatever, the, or 430 40, something. 480 minus 48, so yeah. 432, but then yeah, they played 432. Two time, so 442. Yeah, 442. So, it, like, none of these samples are massive. I'm just going by what I've seen for the most part in this stuff with, like, you know, the Isaiah and Hartenstein. Like, haven't they played? I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Haven't they played 10 games? They have They're five games. games. Oh, yeah. So they so, have so 480, 490. 490. Yeah. 490. There you go. We're a very smart group here. Um, like, I, I do I do think Cam versus Fournier is a legitimate difference, regardless of who the center is. So, again, I think Mitch deserves to get a shot. I'm just projecting for it. And, like, I don't know, man. I, I'm. I think more so than I think Hartenstein is awesome and he's the answer is like, I think it's notable what a center like that, if you're going, if Randall is going to be here and that's just going to be a thing and we already have Brunson and we have RJ, I think you need to ultimately find a better center than Mitchell Robinson. And this little stretch without him has kind of shown what just a center like Hartenstein, who is like a good offensive center, but nothing spectacular, what that can do for you. And it's not just, oh, he's the greatest screen setter ever or anything like that. No, it's just there's these little things he can do that open up the floor a little bit more than Mitch. Screening, having a little floater push shot, being able to pass from the middle of the floor. 
it opens the game up and opens the floor up for guys in ways that I just don't think Mitch, and I even think Mitch can't. He just cannot do it given what he has offensively. And I do think that matters. And I think it should inform the franchise decision making moving forward. So even if the determination is at the end of this, like, okay, Mitch is better than Hartenstein and Sims or whatever, fine. But I've just seen enough at this point, and I know it sounds crazy 10 games into a season where I was like, oh, he's going to be the MVP. I just think I've seen enough at this point that I'm never going to think that Mitch is the answer for this team at the center, at the five. Like, I don't think Mitch is the starting five on whenever this team actually becomes a contender. Uh, I just think he's too offensively limited. And yes, you don't need some post-monster 20-point-per-game, you know, beast offensive player at the five anymore. But I do think you need somebody that can do a little, has a little bit more diversity to their game and is a little bit more capable with the ball in their hands than Mitch. Okay. Guess that's it. Stacy. I, 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 I think that, I think that from a pure ceiling perspective, uh, I was on mute. Sorry. I guess I, so I would agree with this. If we had a four that wasn't Julius Randall or Obi, let's be real. I'm not enamored with either of the defensive abilities. Obi tries hard. He had a nice block last night. Uh, we More don't have good defenders. Too. We we have we don't have good defenders at the four. RJ is very unproven. Um, and I'm going to be a skeptic on that for a long time. Oh wow, it looks like I'm shooting. I gotta put my light on. Um, it looks like I'm shooting one of those hostage videos. Um <laughs> But, um, <laughs> if that's racist i know i'm brown but um <laughs> the point i'm making is um because of the lack of defenders the knicks have like we don't have that luxury that like let's go for offense to the five so that's why i like the ob thing too because i just said he's not a great defender at the four but for the five he would have good mobility wherever you give up on re- like on rebounding you would probably uh make up for with some of that mobility on defense and on offense, you would get like, I just, I trust that a lot. Like if you're going to go with the Hartenstein thing and say, we're going to be worse on defense. Yeah. You said it, Jeff, like let's go all in. And I would agree with Hartenstein, maybe being a better option. If like, if we had Jaron Jackson, hundred percent agree with you, Shun. I would say all of your concerns are valid. Do not see that on this team with how many poor defenders we're playing right now on the perimeter. Uh, yeah. I just, I don't know. I, the The Mitch thing for me is like, at this point, this guy just needs to prove something, man. Like, we played what five? I think he's proved a lot, man. Over but 40. he he, he had, was he a thirty six pick. He was in the first game of the season. How many minutes did he play? I don't know, twenty something. No, played less than twenty. I think he played like fourteen minutes, maybe. Will we play Memphis? Yeah, we played. Oh, Memphis. He got in foul trouble. Yeah, Can, I that. gets in foul trouble. Okay, fine. One game, no big deal. Whatever. Then we play you know, fucking three cupcakes in a row, Mitch is fine. He's the cupcake king, all right? This guy beats up on the cupcakes. He's, That's he's Kevin great. Durant, bro. Yeah, but he's he is great against the worst centers in the league. I'm not, I'm not saying that demeaningly. I mean that. Like, he is awesome in those matchups. And you think, oh, my God, this guy is taking the lead. We play Milwaukee. Okay, not a crime. Can't stand the floor against Giannis. It happens. Not but very They also put him on Giannis. Why did they put him on Giannis, who was not playing the center position? Their center is Brooke Lopez. Why did they put him on Giannis? Because we have power forwards that can't handle that matchup. Uh, I also think it might be because they don't want Mitch hanging out on the perimeter. Against Brooke? I yeah, mean, he Brooke still was... had to guard Giannis on the perimeter. It's not like he just... He wasn't just staying in the paint with Giannis, nominally guarding Giannis. Yeah, but, I mean, it's a little bit different, though, right? Because Brooke is popping out there. He's not just... Yeah, but besides not pop, like Brooke getting is the ball limited. to drive. Fine. Okay, just hear me out. Okay, fine. Whatever it happens, not a big deal. Next game, we play... Uh, who do we play after Milwaukee? Was it... Cleveland, right? Yeah, Cleveland. Another game. Mitch can't stay on the floor. Gets into foul trouble. Like, okay. Fine. It happens. A couple games in a row. Mitch played 20 minutes in that game, by the way. 20, just under 21 minutes uh, against Milwaukee. He played tw- just under 21 minutes. Are we sensing a theme yet? Okay, fine. It happens. No big deal. What does he do against the Hawks? Okay, against the Hawks. Mr. Robinson, 18 minutes. 
Was it all his fault? No. I, the, I, Me and Jeff talked about this. That was a weird one. I thought that, that they should have gone back to him at some point in the fourth quarter. But again, he wasn't very... Well, massively... the whole team sucked against the Hawks. Yeah, but, but again, yeah. he had four He had four fouls in 18 minutes in that game. Okay? Next game. Knicks play the 76ers. Mitch gets hurt in this game. But in 11 minutes, he had three fouls. Three fouls again. Like... You cannot do this. This is not even good. This is unacceptable for a starter. Like his foul rate right now, it's it's like he's fouling more per game than he has in his entire career right now. Not by a lot, but by a little bit. He is averaging 7.9 personal fouls per 100 possessions. That is a career high for him. This is unacceptable. This is I don't care who you're playing. I don't care who your teammates are. I don't care that Evan Fournier sucks ass on defense. I don't care that Julius Randle isn't trying. You've got to be better than that. You've got to be better than that. And if you can't, then I'm sorry. We just have to look elsewhere. But we look at players like RJ or whoever, and we say, well, those things will revert to the mean. Do you think Mitch is actually an average 7.9 fouls per game? Or per, what was it for 40? You said, sorry, my bad. No, but are we going to do this thing where every single year he starts off and he needs like 20 games to get his head screwed yeah, up? Yeah, we can say the same about RJ Barrett. We can say the same about quickly. We say the same thing about no, no, we can't say the same. No, we can't say the same thing about quickly because quickly, yes, missing yeah. shots, fine. And he's but guess what? I'm not worried, but I'm not worried about his focus. Him. I'm not worried about his focus. I'm not worried about is he going to be able to stay on the floor? But like, this, with, this with sounds Mitchell like a moral Robinson, argument every though. single year. Every single year, there's a reason why for the first 15, 20 games of the year, oh, he, he can't – oh, he's hurt. Oh, he's coming back from an injury. Oh, he, he's getting used to this thing. He, the, the other guy – at what point is Mitch just – can? you're the starting center. Can you play – can you just stay on the floor? Can you just be on the floor for 25 minutes a night? No, he doesn't need to play 35, do you 40 think minutes. The, do you think his fouls are affected at all by being surrounded by four shitty defenders? I think – that the entire argument for Mitchell Robinson is that he is an elite defender. And if you're an elite defender, you cover up holes, especially at the five. Isn't like, the argument for RJ for, for quickly even right. I'm obviously a huge quickly fan. He's shooting 30% from three. A big part of Quickly's argument is that it doesn't matter that he doesn't get to the rim a lot because he can pull up. He's a great pull up shooter, but then you like, and he's been bad for the first half of seasons. He was bad for the first half of last season. And he was a right net now. positive. This is like the, he so was a is, net positive in these lineups. Mitchell Robinson is not playing like a net positive right now. These, this is a fact. It does not matter. It, he has not been a net positive player this year. I even if you, the, even the if you take, even if Mitch. you take, even if you take the entire Fournier sample. Okay, so just get rid of all the minutes that Mitchell Robinson has played with Evan Fournier. Get rid of all of them. He's still a minus net rating in the it's only 55 minutes, but even in those minutes, he's not he's not been a positive. And the offense has been terrible in those minutes. You think he's he's a hundred hundred and one point eight offensive rating. Hundred and one point eight offensive rating in fifty-five minutes without Evan Fournier on the floor. Yes, great. 103.5 defensive rating. But half the he can't stay on the floor. So you're not even getting the benefit of him being a great defensive player because See, that's he a, can't stay on the floor. You're talking about eight. So there's two things. One, if your argument is well. There's always excuses, or he's coming into camp out of shape. Whatever, like that seems more of like a a moral argument about you should be better more than like what actually makes the team better, right? Because I think quickly should quickly supposed to shoot. Period. He can't shoot thirty percent from three, right? Period. I'm a huge quickly fan. He brings a ton of other stuff to the game. He, he can't shoot thirty percent from three. So if we're gonna okay, talk but, like but, that but, about but, Mitch, no, but you but just, you're so just, you're the, dismissing. The you're saying he can't shoot thirty percent from the from the floor, at, but at the same time you're like, but he brings all these other. You yeah, can but shoot thirty percent. You're talking. You you're can shoot. Can't set screens, you can shoot thirty percent. You're dismissing from the floor. everything he brings that nobody else. He's on not the mix bringing, What is he bringing right now? He's not being on the floor. He cannot stay on the floor. But so he's not he's, bringing he's anything. He's the only good rebounder the Knicks have, besides, ironically, he quickly. can't stay on the floor, Stacy. When he's there, he's the only good he rebounder. He could be. Stuff. He could be Moses Malone if he can't stay on the floor. Who fucking cares? Okay, so if you think that he's going to continue to not stay on the floor or to foul at the rate he has been, that's the same argument to say, well, quickly shooting thirty percent from three. So why should I expect him to not shoot better? Because the, the people tend to revert to their career means. So for the same reason I don't expect quickly to shoot 30% from three, I don't expect Mitch to average 7.9 fouls per game. And especially, Schwinn, I feel like we've talked about in the past that staying out of foul trouble is actually an area where Thibodeau has really helped Mitch. 
So, you know, maybe he has just gotten worse. I'm not saying that's an impossibility, but it is kind of, you know, a small sample size. Just be like, oh, he's just really bad. He's just really he, bad at staying out of foul trouble. Like, so I feel aside like aside from his bit. third year, which was Tibbs' first year, right? That was Tibbs' first year. Every single year, he has had the same exact issues to start the year. And yes, it will get better. But he's not going to magically become... Like the fundamental reality that you could is, say the same thing about quickly and RJ. They always no, start you the year can't, off bad. You can't do that because they always start the year off poorly. You oh just said God, that every this, year. This is such a ridiculous argument because you're so married to the idea of Mitchell Robinson starting center. The fact of the matter is, you're starting Julius Randle. We have three plus years of evidence that Mitchell Robinson and Julius Randle does not work. That is a fact of life. Deal with it. Like, if he's not going to be able to function in that context, who cares what he does? Because it's not helping you win basketball games, really. He has to be better at something if that's not going to be an elite defensive center who can stay on the floor regardless of whatever issues, then it doesn't matter. And it's uh, he can't just be good on the defense. He has to be great because he's giving you absolutely nothing on offense other than offensive rebounding. He doesn't set screens. He doesn't make life for anybody easier offensively. He doesn't create space. He doesn't make plays. He can't space the floor in any capacity. So he has to be elite defensively. And he has not shown anything close to that this year. And if and they really had good defenders who could make up for it, I would agree that it's meaningless. But it isn't because their defenders suck ass. They, they, they are, what are they? I think they're like they are top terrible. 12 Every other defense fucking right defender that plays besides quickly, sometimes Cam and RJ sucks. They are basically a fine defensive team in all of the non 40 minutes. With Mitch, without Mitch, doesn't matter. We have a sample going back to last year. They were a top five defensive team with the same personnel you're extremely dismissive of in all of the non Kemba minutes. The same with personnel. Mitch, without Mitch, doesn't matter. They I played think, a ton I was, of I, I, no, I'm just going to say it. I think his defensive status is completely overrated by Nick okay, Jones. I don't think a single other franchise would look at him and be like, oh my God, if we get Mitchell Robinson, our defense is going to make some massive leap. When has he shown this? What about him right now is showing this? The one time in his career we were like, oh, 100% if Mitch was here, he'd been better, was because we had Nerlens Noel who can't catch the ball. Like, other than, like, since the Knicks have gotten respectable, we'll call it, I don't think there's much evidence of, like, oh, my God, Mitch Robinson's moving the needle in ways that nobody else could possibly replicate. Like, I, 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 I'm sorry. I just don't see it. Like, I, maybe I'm blind. I don't know. But I'm watching this team this year, and I'm like, okay, yeah, Mitch is a good defensive player. I don't think anybody on this team is particularly elite on defense other than maybe... But I think you have a lot, Jordan, you have a lot of shitty defenders. I mean, <coughs> I, I think that's also an example. RJ is not a good defender. I'm just going to go out and say that. Sometimes, can, can he be? Yes. But he isn't consistently. Cam is not a good defender. Can he be? Yes. But we don't see that consistently. Randall is a bad defender, period. Brunson is a bad defender, even though he tries. Fournier sucks. Um, and then you have Grimes and Quickly, who are good defenders. So if you're it. an elite defender and you need other everybody else to be good on defense, then you're not an elite it's defender. It's not good. It's not being asked. Dude. No, they, like, did you, when RJ is Rudy bad, Gobert, Rudy Gobert anchored terrible. a defense that had that was literally okay. just filled with terrible defenders. Okay, so Mitch is not Rudy Gobert. He's like he's a what right is he? below the tier below that. Is he if? Is he right now? What is he? Mitch is Mitch is what twenty four? Is that right? He's twenty four. Is he at twenty four as good as Clint Capella was at twenty four? I did, what year was Clint Capella twenty four? That would have been. It's kind of amazing. Clint Capella is only twenty eight. Uh, so that he would that was twenty eighteen nineteen. I mean, I've never thought of Clint Capella as elite, just because, yeah. I'll say that. So I think he's probably in that. I would put him on that realm. And Capella, so, Capella is a tough one to judge because Harden was so good. Like Mitch has never had anything close to Harden. But some of the stuff that Capella was able to do on the roll with Harden, I don't think Mitch could have done. I do think that we would – I think, Stacy, you would be more sympathetic to Stacy's point about vertical gravity if he got to play with a Harden who was constantly – putting, you know, dunks on a platter for him. Um, and you're seeing that with Brunson at times too, by the way, I think, but yeah. Yeah. Um, but Mitch is in like another world compared to Capella, de Capella, excuse me, defensively. Um, I see. I just, I just don't see that. Like I really, and I, I say that as somebody who has, you can probably find tweets and 
fucking comments I left on PNT where like, I think defensively his ceiling when Mitch is at his best on defense, definitely better than Capella. He is not at that level consistently. He's just not like he has games and stretches that he puts together and you're like, Oh my God, is he putting it together? And then he just can't keep it going. And like Capella's boring. Capella's nothing special. I think especially over the last couple of years, he slowed down. He's definitely not as good a defensive player as he was when he was in Houston now. Um, but I think Houston was pretty damn good on defense. And he's pretty damn good on a team that itself was pretty damn good. Did it for multiple years. Mitch has never done that. Mitch is not. Ne- Capella's a guy, he was playing at 24 years old. He was playing 33 and a half minutes a night. And, you know, I'm not saying Mitch has to play 33 and a half minutes a night. Otherwise, you can't be Clint Capella or have the same type of impact and be in the same tier. But, like, playing minutes is part of being an elite defender. And if I can't depend on you to play a bunch of minutes because we're not putting, you know, four other guys on the floor that are plus defenders, like, then I just don't really care about you. And, like, that's kind of where I'm at with Mitch. He's fine, good player, not going to be offended if the Knicks keep starting him. But I am very much on the lookout for an upgrade because I'm sick of his bullshit. I am. I am sorry. Like, I am sick and tired of watching this guy do nothing on offense, embarrassing himself with his screens, picking up stupid fouls. I'm done with it. Like, I'm okay, dude. I, I, I can find similar center production elsewhere. We're not we're not gonna trade Mitchell Robinson and be like, oh my God, the how did we let this guy go? I don't think we will. I don't. I, I I've seen nothing from him in what is now his fifth year in the NBA to make me think that. Um I don't think his contract is an albatross. I don't think he's a bad player. I just don't care about him. There are good players that don't really matter that much to me. He's one of them. Um I'll let you guys have the final word on it, and then we can move on because we've talked about Mitchell Robinson way more than I think anybody would anticipate we've talked about anything on this podcast. Yeah, I said what I'd say. Jeff, anything? Um, I think that we just – we need things to normalize a bit more before we can – I don't know. I I I, I am hard pressed to say that the team can just lose Mitch the rest of the season and be well. It depends on what your definition of fine is, but like be better off. I don't know. I I, I think that I mean, if we got if we lost Mitch and then we got Victor Romanyama, would you th- say that made us fine? <laughs> I yeah, would say I I love Mitch, but I think that would be okay. Personally. That'd be pretty cool. Um, I do think <laughs> not even including the we could be so bad we'd get a Victor type. I do think an interesting discussion to have, which we can have some other time um, would be, does removing Mitch from the rotation just raise the team ceiling? Like, because Mitch is kind of the ultimate Tibbs player in terms of like, I know he is kind of volatile, but at the same time, what he does on the floor is almost like a guarantee. It's just whether he can stay on the floor or not, but like, he's going to be in the paint. He's going to use his length. He's going to, you know, box out, yada, yada, yada. There's not really a high ceiling to his style of play, but there's an unknown ceiling to Obi being guaranteed 25 minutes a night too. So I am very interested in that side of Schwinn's argument in the sense of, maybe just removing Mitch from the rotation gives the Knicks an opportunity that they just otherwise wouldn't have with him in the rotation. Yeah. I mean, I didn't even get to that. Like that, that would be part of my argument. And I think like, would I rather invest in the Mitchell Robinson at starting center thing, or would I rather dump him risk the defense falling off a cliff and opening up 25 minutes a night for Obi? Yes, I would much rather do that. And I think that, to your point, does give the Knicks a ceiling that they don't have otherwise. Uh, I do want to swing back on the Emmanuel Quickly point um, because I know that Stacy wasn't saying that Emmanuel Quickly sucks at basketball. Uh, I just want to, you know, look, I, I think it's, it is it is worth noting for uh, us here at the Quickland. Um, we should note that Emmanuel Quickly, who is shooting terribly from the field yet again, uh, and who constantly has to prove himself, apparently, every single game. Otherwise, it is a crisis. He, once again, has the highest on-court rating for the team and the highest on-off rating 
uh, early in this season, 214 minutes played. Uh, the reason I bring this up is I don't really understand the conversation around him. And yes, I get that he's shooting poorly from the field. He's not shooting that much. He's like, I think he's almost like very visibly taken a step back on offense. And like, I got to bring up the 40th thing. Like I did this yesterday. It's kind of crazy, man. If you, if 40 is basically in the Kemba zone right now, if you just, if you go through every single two man combination for the Knicks from the rotation guys. So I guess, is it fair to say of the rotation guys, we can say uh, this current starting five, Mitch, Quickly, Rose, Obi, and that's it, I think. Wait, what? And for and Fournier. And right? Fournier. And Fournier. Yeah. So if you go through all of these two man combinations, literally every single one, Fournier doesn't have a positive one. And every single player has like multiple positive two man combinations other than him. Like he is the single biggest issue with this team. And I bring that up because like yes, quickly struggling. He is not shooting well from the field. I simply do not care if if that like I will still give him minutes and take minutes from Fournier because yeah. that's basically who is he's competing with minutes for at this moment in time because it seems like Tibbs has again decided that he's not a point guard for the time being. Um, so like I, I don't know. I just think the entire conversation around quickly is really weird. Where it's like it feels like he constantly has to prove that he's a good player, and it's like as soon like he had that he had a bad game against um, who was it? who did we just play before uh, against Boston? Did not have a good game. I actually did this very fun exercise. If you just look at his minutes and Obi's minutes and Rose's minutes, without in the in the in the minutes they had without Fournier, they were fine. As long as soon as you put Fournier in that game, all of them were terrible. And the same goes with the starters. Uh, he was the gap in that game. I don't feel bad about saying that. Did they have issues beyond Evan Fournier's existence? Of course, their defense was terrible, but he exacerbated so much in that game. Um, but like, I don't think we have two years of evidence of quickly just being a massive net positive. Okay, and does that mean that he he never has to shoot better? No, that's not what that means. But what it does mean is that like when he goes through a shooting slump, we can stop pretending that he's unplayable. And that he, you know, he, but I don't, that's not the conversation, right? I don't, I don't, know. Think, I don't know. And so I think that there is a certain segment of Twitter that we don't have to talk about that is pushing that. The question for me, like you said, this kind of, you alluded to this preseason, like you didn't get excited when quickly and Obi had good games in preseason, right? Yeah. I didn't say anything about it. I didn't say anything about quickly yesterday. I thought he had a really good game, but I didn't really, I mean, he was, he was solid. I mean, his defense was amazing. It was a solid offense performance. Here's the thing, right? If Quickly is going to be an average three-point shooter or a slightly below average three-point shooter, he's still a good bench player. I agree with that because his defense is that. And that has really been a revelation. Um, but he's, is he Lugens Dort or is he like Tony Allen? Not quite. So that makes him a bench player. And I think he's better than Dort, way better than Dort. Overall, as on defense? Yeah. Okay. Um, I do think as a team defender, I'd agree Dort has some certain on ball proclivities. Yeah, that, I mean if in that sense, like in if that, you want to someone to guard Jalen yeah. Brown, then yeah, like you're gonna Yeah, take... yeah. Like the the that element of defense, to be clear, yes. Like no, no question, Dort is and uh, I mean and we saw it yesterday, like quickly got beat off the dribble by D'Angelo Russell. That's actually why Cam came in, right? At the end. I mean uh, yeah, I'm not sure that that was a wise I mean what I don't want to I don't want I anybody actually, think I actually shitting thought, on Cam, but yeah, like that that's, that was actually yeah. I didn't I thought that I love that length, the length in that lineup. But anyway, yeah, get, yeah. getting us get away from that, and I don't think that's necessarily a knock on quickly. I just yeah, think and I just just to be very clear, I am not that was not me being critical of Cam coming back in. I just state's been hopping in Schwinn's yeah, DMs. Yeah, right. No, I just I just <laughs> I just want to be very clear. I, I'm like very happy with how Cam Radish has played. I just like I don't think that was necessarily the singular reason he came in. I just think Tibbs wanted to bring Reddish back in, and I am fine with that. I think Reddish was good, and that helps see out the game. So whatever. But my point with Quickly is the same point we just made about Mitch, is that, yeah, like, Mitch Quickly is obviously a good player, a really good perimeter defender. Like, it's fun. Like, I would argue, actually, as a, in terms of his rotations and his ability to use his length, he's Frank level now. He's as good as, like, Frank was. 
Um, but it's the same thing with Mitch. It's like he's a good. You said he's a good player, but there's a lot of good players I don't care about. For me to care about quickly, and I think he is this level of shooter. That's why I do care about quickly. Is um, he's got to be 37, 38 percent, including the pull up volume. You know, something like 50 50 pull up and catch and shoot, but he finishes at 38 percent from three. And his two point shooting has been really good actually this year. Need to see it. Need to see it happen. It's too frustrating to see guys like Bones Highland, Tyrese Maxey, who I think quickly is every bit as good of a shooter as consistently putting up these 40% shooting seasons and quickly having these long stretches. He's got to be better. That's just a fact. Uh, what if I told you? Because, like, I'm not arguing about whether quickly should be a rotation player. I'm talking about should quick is like quickly someone we need to prioritize the franchise. That's the question we're trying to figure out. And 30% no, I, I don't, I don't, look, I want to be very clear. I don't think we should be prioritizing the franchise right away. quickly. Um, well, I think there's a question that we might. I mean, we, me and you were not thrilled about sending him in a Donovan Mitchell trade. So prioritizing, if that's too strong a word, have him as a priority. Like, how should this franchise value him? Um, should they value him as a very useful role player? You know, is he, is he, you know, Bruce Brown or something? He's not, you know, that kind of a player. Or is he like, you know, a Jordan Poole or, or, you know, maybe what the Fred Van Fleet was for the, the Raptors before he got his extension? That's what we need to figure out. And that's why, like, yeah, I'm going to harp on the shooting. Yeah, like, I get the shooting thing. It has to come around. My point is, what they're doing right now actually isn't, pri- it, it's not prioritizing him in any capacity. Yeah. Um, like, they've already, he's, his role's already changed like three times now this year. He was first guard off the bench. He's the second point guard. Now he's, you know, the the combo guard. And then, it, like, they've already changed his they, they keep changing his role. Just stick him in a role. If you don't think he's a point guard, fine. Just give him all of the backup. I, I actually disagree with that, too. I think that having multiple roles, it's the same way wide receivers, young wide receivers learn. Then you need a different roles. coach. Then no, you need like, a different if coach. You learning, learning different roles, but, like, he's good at both of those roles. So let's, like, yeah, but Let you toggle. Like, them, right? like the, what you're talking about is like, okay, you you play both positions seamlessly in a lineup kind of thing. But what that's not how we're really – that's not how no, Tibbs I mean, he doesn't stand things. at the corner next to Rose. Like he's usually – even when Rose plays, he's usually involved in the action, right? I think, there's, like to- I think, I think there's a very big difference in like the type of offense where both players are being enabled to initiate the offense versus – when you when you were the point guard in the Tibbs offense, when you were running the show, yes. Does for example, right? We don't need to. If we go to the starters, does RJ Barrett get initiation reps? Yeah, he does. But how does he get them? Right? It's him waiting on the second side for Brunson to swing on the ball, and then he gets a rep. It's not like they're alternating possessions. It's not some fluid, you know, co-sharing beautiful thing. No, it's like very very segmented offense. And so there's a difference. Like that's why I think it, it is important for quickly to be the first card off the bench. I wouldn't harp on this as much under a different coach, but with Tibbs, it is very, very important. And if you look at the last three or four games, Rose has started or Rose has, he comes in for Brunson. And then when he comes out, Brunson comes in and Brunson is always the point guard and Rose is always the point guard. Quickly, yes, does quickly get some initiation reps? Of course. Yeah, he does. But he's not actually running the offense anymore. But if, and if that is a stark departure in, from how he was at the start of the year where he was very much running the offense. I but think if there's quickly a big came, when quickly there. was coming in first, it was usually for Fournier. So like he wasn't get like he wasn't coming in for Brunson usually. No, like but, Brunson but was there. It was very obvious that he was he was bringing the ball up. Rose was not bringing the ball up. Quickly was bringing. You the mean ball Brunson? Up. When quickly or, plays with Brunson, Brunson. No, no, still... I'm talking about one. Okay, so yes, he'd come in for Fournier, but when Brunson went out, which was usually for Rose at that point, quickly then became the point guard. And he's bringing the ball up. He's setting up the offense, and that's how it was. So you're saying I, the bigger I noted issue this is at that the time, when he plays with I, Rose, Rose is now the initiator. That yeah, seems to be the I, bigger and I, issue and than I, the sub. I, I would I would tell you to do this. Go back and watch the Cleveland game. Watch the first half, and then watch the fourth quarter. That is when that is when the change happened. That is when Tibbs went back to old reliable and decided, we're up nine. I need Derrick Rose to see this one out, baby. And since that point in time, it has been a very tangible difference to me of quickly is not running the offense. 
quickly is the off-ball guard. Yes, he gets some initiation reps, but it is a lot closer to what he was doing his first year, right, when he was playing with Rose, than it was last year, what we saw, and even at the start of this year, what we saw. But to, be, that, to be clear, sorry, just to get your yeah. your stance is essentially that when quickly came in first, even after Rose came in, he was the initiator, yes. even with yes. Rose on. Absolutely. And now, just because of the fact that Rose is coming in, I'm not saying this is, I, I, I can get it, but when Rose comes in first, it sets the tone that he is going to be the initiator. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if it's an uh, it's if it's an actual instruction. I don't know if it's unintentional. I don't know what it is exactly. But I think there has been a very tangible difference, and I'm pretty sure I brought this up to Jeff that before, like that Cleveland game was a very, very that was like a definite change in how things went in in terms of his role, and that's fine to me. That if that is the role they want him in, fine. That doesn't it doesn't need to thrill me, but then give him the right amount of minutes. Like in that role, he should be getting way more minutes than Fournier ever. Like there should never be a half where Fournier plays more than him. Yesterday, the first half, the fact that Fournier played more than him was insane. Um, but like Fournier, first of all, shouldn't be playing right now. And all of those minutes should they don't need to all of them go to quickly. But you're talking about like that's like 12, 13 minutes a night. Give like four of those to quickly. And then split the rest between Rose, Brunson, RJ, Cam, however you want to do it. Like, you've got to get this kid. I don't care what he's shooting from the floor. Get him 25 minutes a night and do it consistently. Because that's how you get a player to, like, get... He's not comfortable. He's, like, playing right now where he's looking over his shoulder every single time he, he does something. When he shoots the ball, it's like he's terrified of making a mistake, you know? Um I don't particularly like that. I don't like seeing that. I don't. But he think... shot forty percent as a rookie from three, with the same with a worse situation. I think Tibbs has more trust in him now. I mean, no. you can. I would. I would sooner buy that quickly. He's just going through a rough slump. Then I would buy that it's. I don't think he's. He's not. He's. We love him because he's not built like that, dude. This guy loves to fucking play. I don't. I, I don't think know. he's in. I think he's very much in his own head right now. I, yesterday was actually good to see him. I thought he was just playing yesterday offensively specifically um but like i i i don't i don't think when i've watched him that he's playing with like the kind of i don't want to say I'll, he plays with like a reckless abandon kind of he, he plays with like a it's a very Josh like Allenism. it's a very it's a very like <laughs> arrogant style of play sometimes but it's like very fun and it's carefree it's very it's off the cuff right he like plays very off the cuff so he's ball at his don't stop type of yeah. game yeah he does in a lot of ways but like he he does play like a very off the cuff style and i think right now he is like trying to it it doesn't look like it's off the cuff it looks like he's trying to do things in a very specific way and order and fashion he's and like, like Nick cannon and drumline trying to play sheet music when he's used to just improvising and that's a great comparison actually right, right, right. um it it is like it is a lot like that and that that maybe that's just part of what he needs to go through right now maybe like you know that happens with young players that's fine i think he had to deal with something similar last year and in the moment it always sucks when you're watching it but like you can't watch the like watch the stuff that he was doing at the end of last year like the last 25 30 games a year and then watch what he's doing on offense right now he he's not playing the same with the same freedom or kind of just uh joie de vivre uh you know he, he's not playing with that type of joy and that type of carefreeness and like it manifests i think in him like so much of his field goal percentage to me is about the shots he's taking and I just don't like the shots he's taking right now. And I'm not putting that on Tibbs, by the way. Like, I'm not. I'm saying that I think this kind of, like, I don't think he was happy in that Atlanta game for a variety of reasons. His agent or his handler or whatever the fuck you want to call it posted a bunch of stuff on IG about it. Uh, and actually, uh, he had a bunch of Benji uh, tweets in there, so which was funny. But, like, I don't think he was particularly pleased about, okay, now I am the second guard at the bench and uh, Rose is coming in ahead of me and all these kind of things. I, look, w what is the point of that? And Jeff, I think you talked about it on the rundown after that game, but like, there's no point in Derrick Rose coming in ahead of him. Like, there, it's and, and prioritizing giving him initiation reps over quickly. There's no 
there's no clear benefit to it right now in the present, by the way. And obviously, long term, it doesn't. It's irrelevant. So, like, I just don't get it, and I'm just going to shut up and let Jeff talk. Well, and remember, Tibbs took a shot at him in the in the. Oh yeah. Post. He he called quickly out for trying to toss a lob over the the zone when quickly played like a perfect game, and that was one of his best games of the season. And Rose had like that was the game when Randall was, you know, getting pickpocketed in the middle of the zone against the Hawks. And wait. Yeah, quickly did play well against the Hawks, right? I'm not. I'm not yeah, he played. He played well. That was the game he had yeah. like 16 rebounds or whatever. Right, right. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, and Rose, like they asked, like what the issue was, or they asked Thibodeau what the issue was, and he was like, he made he, the one thing he said was one of Quickly's mistakes. And um, I just want to say, I think there's a very large middle ground between what the two of you were saying, and um, it doesn't involve Quickly playing six first half minutes. That's ridiculous, and it should never I happen. I, I, that. Yeah. <laughs> right, but that's what. But when you said you just said, Stacy, like, well, we have to figure out if we're going to prioritize the guy. Him playing so more than I six. When I talk about prioritizing him, I'm talking about if we're trading for Donovan Mitchell or we're trading for a player like that. I that's right, what but, we need to figure out. Should we be like, giving him 20 minutes? Is not a question, right? Right. But like, but that, right that's the that's, point. That's though. what we're saying. That's what yeah. we're saying is that in the meantime, yeah, that's where I'm agreed because the, and the defense and all of that does matter. Right, but I'm I'm hoping for this guy to, to beat Fred VanVleet. So that's right. going I, to I just think I just think it's thirty percent so. I, I just think it's really hard to to expect like Cam. Right, I think one of the things that's benefited Cam is obviously injuries have opened up chances for him. But like because of how Tibbs views the wings, like you know, size and all this kind of things. Cam has just gotten more minutes than I think anybody would have expected to start the year. And he's taken advantage of that because he knows that, like, to some extent, I mean, it helps that Evan Forney has been terrible. He's like, okay, like, even if I make a couple of mistakes, like, Tibbs is probably going to stick with me here. And he can play through that. Whereas, like, as soon as as soon as soon Derrick Rose hit whatever mythical threshold that Tibbs needed him to hit, it was like, okay, Derrick Rose is now, he's the backup point guard again, and that's that. Like, that's a, I don't think that's, easy for a young player because it's not like if I'm him, I'm like, what, when do I ever like, so I can just never have a slump. And if I ever have a slump, then I get demoted. And now you're like, okay, well now I have to make perfect decisions and I got to make this shot and I got to make that shot. Got to make this rotation. I got to do this thing. I think that's a, re- that's a really hard way to live. And like, that's why I have a lot of not just sympathy, I should say, but I, I have a lot of respect for like what OB and quickly have done to the first two years of their career because they've had the shortest of leashes in a lot of times, a lot of instances. And like, that's really tough. And I think it's tougher for him because to me, this is just me. I think for him, like, okay, they signed Jalen Brunson, but you think after the way I closed last year, like, and we start the year and I am the first point guard, I have some leeway. I have some rope to like, if I'm not shooting well for a little bit, I'm I'm still gonna get my opportunities to go out there and 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 do my thing and play 20 minutes a night, 25 minutes a night. And it's like, actually, no, nope, not how it's gonna work at all. Um, and like, I don't know. I just I don't want it to sound like I'm making an excuse for why he's shooting poorly. And I agree with you, he has to shoot better. But like, I just think it's he's being put in a very tough position because of yeah, we can talk about Tim's, but like. The fact that the front office is cool with this, apparently. Like, Derrick Rose should not be playing more than him and should not be a priority in any capacity over him. It just shouldn't. You know, like, the same stuff we say about Obi and, like, we got to find ways to get him on the floor. Yeah, I'm sorry. Quickly can shoot like shit. If he's just going to continue being this massive on-court positive when he's not playing with, when he's literally playing with anybody in any combination other than Evan Fournier, you have to get him on the floor more. And, like... That, I, I don't know what else to say other than that because I find the conversation on him so frustrating where it's like, for two years, you know, oh, we can talk about his field goal percentage and yeah, he's had rough shooting months and all these kind of things. Well, goal, the average true shooting. That's yeah, his, I hated about that. Over, over the course... Conversation. Yes, since, since he started, right, since his the moment he stepped foot on the NBA floor, he's got a higher true shooting percentage than R.J. Barrett or Julius Randle. He's got a higher three-point shooting percentage than all those guys. Like, he's been more... He was more efficient than Alfred Payton. He was more efficient than. Low bar, like, but yeah. yeah, but but like my point is like, if we're gonna say, oh, he has to shoot better, he has to do do this thing, he has to be more efficient to earn his minutes. I mean, I don't know if that's the case. I just think like, 
I think, we're just I think that weird tip stuff. I think I also think we're kind of getting into this thing where at least for me, maybe I'm not looking at the same tweets or whatever as you guys, but for me, when the conversation is he needs to be more efficient, it's more is this a guy I want to give 15, 20 million dollars to after to extend? That is that is a conversation, which is a compliment to quickly, by the way, right? He was picked 25th. That is a real conversation around him. Like, is there a Jordan? Like, should he be getting a Jordan Poole? That is that is on the table if he has a great season. And that changes the Knicks franchise. That's what I'm talking about. If there are people who are talking about whether he should be in the rotation, obviously that's not – but I, I think that's a minority. I think most people right now are trying to figure out, of our young guys, not just IQ, RJ, OB, Camp, is there a guy we want to give $20 million a year to and extend him and be like, no, when we are a championship team, this guy's staying on the team. Or if we trade for a star, this guy can be the centerpiece, right? Well, um, and, I, but like, and I think to that end, right, that, that latter end, because I've seen a lot of like, oh – Oh, you guys didn't want to give him up for Donovan Mitchell, and uh, or, like not just him, right? I've seen this about Grimes and other guys, and it's like, well, no, I didn't. But like, if it was me running the team, if I didn't trade him for Donovan Mitchell, I would be making it a priority to give him twenty five minutes a night, like because I didn't yeah, trade him I for a reason. There's, there's no disagreement. Yeah, there, and it's just like, and so like, I think like the other part of that too is if you want to trade these guys for a star, we've talked about this endlessly, you have to put them on the floor. Uh, I don't want to get stuck up on the quickly thing. And I do want to go back to the weekend games, especially the Boston game. And I want to get your guys take away from this. I thought, look, I've seen a lot. And there's been enough written about this. I don't want to belabor this point, and I, but I do want to mention it. The Knicks defense was terrible. Uh, unfortunately, my whipping boy, Mitchell Robinson, wasn't there. So I can't blame him solely for the, the struggles of the Knicks defense. Um, no, like the, the perimeter rotations were a disaster. The Celtics are also a really tough cover. Uh, I'm pretty sure they have the number one half court offense, in the NBA so far this year. And it's not even close. Like they're lapping the league in half court offense. That's so a big deal, by the yeah. way, considering how much they struggled last year. Yeah. So yeah. Maybe you may going was a good deal, but sorry. Yeah. Ahead. But it was, it was just, I think I saw a lot of people freaking out about that. And the Knicks defense was bad. It needs to tighten up. It did tighten up yesterday which isn't a, a huge bar because Minnesota is awful right now. Um, but like, so I, I want to, I wanted to mention that because now that we've mentioned that I'm very happy with what I'm seeing from RJ Barrett. Uh, and I thought that game against Boston was the best game of his offensive game of his. That was all sustainable to me. Everything he did in that game was sustainable. Not, it wasn't like he had that game against New Orleans last year where he was super hot on pull up threes randomly, right? Awesome game. That was fantastic to watch. Ultimately, we saw like, yeah, he's not going to be a guy that probably lives that way. That Boston game was awesome to me because he, I was like, all of this is sustainable. All of this is. And actually, the fuck ups he had, which were like stupid passes off the drives, I'm like, I don't mind him making that because I'm like, that's, you have to do that to eventually stop doing that. And that's a bigger deal because like the, frustration at the start of the year was that he had tunnel vision on those on, on so many drives and he's forcing up shots and now the frustration in that game was like now he's finishing like a lot of these drives but when he's passing he's not making the right read or he's forcing it but he's trying to make different types of reads and you want to see that but that game to me was again the best offensive game of his that of his career that was achieved in like nothing about that game you're not going to, all of that is something that he can do consistently. Uh, I was so impressed with him and, you know, he burned Tatum one, on a one, a one-on-one situation in that game. He was, I, again, cannot say how impressed I was with that performance. I'll uh, one up you. I thought the Timberwolves game was the best game of his career from a sustainability standpoint. I actually thought he, in I thought all the things you're saying he did in the Boston game, which are all true. He actually, um, like, took a step forward from that game, um, especially moving off the ball. He got two buckets, specifically making baseline cuts on the strong side. Um, and his passing, both on the drive, and uh, he hit Randall with this beautiful cross-court pass to, hit, to mm. set him up for his first three. That's just not a pass he ever makes before. Um, I think he's seeing the floor better. And I thought he defended better in the Timberwolves game than he did in the Boston game, which you just need to see. I thought – I think it's the 
most sure I've been, and I'm not saying I'm like a hundred percent sure, but it's, it's the most sure I've been that like, okay, like he's making these strides we want to see from him. Um, and Schwinn, you've been on it for a few games now, his passing. He had this just wonderful pick and roll manipulation against the 76ers to set Isaiah Hardenstein up with mm. um with a layup. And he's just showing this improved craft. Um he's never gonna be Harden in terms of how he sets teammates up, but or just dribbling the ball. Right, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, he's just never going to be James Harden. Uh, and that's okay. We don't need him to be James Harden. Uh, thank God. Yeah, thank God. Exactly. Um, we, we like watching basketball. Um, but you do need to see these improvements. And I think people are too enamored with what he does as a scorer. And they don't really take into account what's important for his long term. And I think defense, passing, and scoring from the rim to 10 feet are the things we need to focus on in terms of evaluating how good he can be in the long term. Because I don't think he's ever going to be, you know, again, James Harden or like, you know, an elite three-point shooter in terms of like pull-up shooting. But I, I don't think he's bad. Like, I, I, I know he goes through these weird slumps, especially to start the season. But it would very much surprise me if he doesn't level off as like a 35 to 37 percent three point shooter. I just think that's who he's going to be. Um, and I think his diversity of three point shooting, I think a big difference between him and Randall as offensive players is he's a much more willing catch and shooter. Um, I, I think if I was going to give a posi- uh, uh, the biggest positive to Randall as a score yesterday is how willing a three a catch and shoot three point shooter he was yesterday. Normally he likes to catch kind of take his time. And then, you know, we all know we've all seen it. He he's just much more comfortable shooting off the dribble because that's what a lot of these guys have done their entire lives. But RJ has really, really grown as a shooter off the catch. So yeah, I don't think we really have to worry about his shooting. I think there's a very safe zone that he's going to end up in. Um, it's the defense, the passing, and the finishing um, that are really going to make or break who he is as a player and how good he can be. And the Boston game, and then what he followed it up with in the Minnesota game, he really thrived in those areas. Um, and it was just super encouraging. And I, I'm so happy about it because he started the season off really slow and it took every fiber in my being to not respond to people who are like, Oh, RJ's a slow starter. And Oh, it's his teammates fault to not be like, yeah, buy that. but like, it's year four. We can't make these excuses for him anymore. It's time. And he it's got time. paid. Right. So. Right. And he yeah. got paid. So I'm not saying he has to hit his ceiling today, but I'm saying that the excuses need to become less and less. And he just has to, he can't be like a negative player anymore. He yeah. just has to be a good player. And I, yeah. I one, one other thing. So I think that the, like, the thing you always will credit, like when when Tibbs is like, "Well, he needs to get in the gym and shoot." I, it, I'm. It's always been tough for me to believe that that's the issue, right? With RJ. and I'm just to be and just to be clear, like what he said when he said that last year, I do think he was like insinuating that like RJ had not been keeping the same routine that he had. And the it's year just before. tough for me to believe yeah. that though. Well, I mean, did I, RJ go through something? Maybe like a family issue. Well, maybe I don't know, but. Like, RJ just is that dude. We know and, that, right? And, yeah, and I was just going to say, like, I actually thought when he said it this year, the quote was did not match up with, like, if you watch the video, it was with the way Tibbs was saying it. I can't believe I'm, I'm defending my favorite coach right now. Uh, but the way Tibbs said it, it was like he was expressing confidence in RJ that that he is putting in the work and will put in the work, and that's why – he knows that he's going to come yeah. around. The, this yeah. context, no, I, I agree with that. Yeah, but, it, uh, could, but it, I think... it could also be relative, though, right? Like, Qu- quickly and, and and Grimes are top point zero zero one percent workers, like crazy people. So Tibbs so could have RJ, a bias. Right? No, but I'm I, I I mean, obviously, I only have so much information, but I get the feeling that Tibbs's perspective may not be in a vacuum. RJ is a bad worker but he sees quickly and Grimes killing themselves. And maybe it's more like 
he's not working as hard as these other guys. That's just... that could, and I mean, it seems to be very much, you know, through setting that, you know, ceiling, it's very high. Um, for me, it's more, um, you know, with RJ, one thing I think we can take away, and I'd be curious to, he's shooting 82% from free throw line. Multiple of the NBA Twitter shot doctors, shout out Prez, shout out DJ, Ace Zulo, shout out Benji, have talked about RJ having a higher release. That seems to be a big deal, right? Um, and Shwin, I know you brought this up in, um, well, in a DM with uh, with me and Seth Part now. Um, but part of his issue seems to be he's getting a rough whistle. Um, I don't. Yeah. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? Because if his free throw rate gets back to last year, uh, you know, even with the oh, shooting I struggles, think... he's at fifty. He, he's right now his so true it... shooting has improved. Sorry, I'll, I'll excuse me. His yep, true sorry. shooting has actually improved for 51 to 53. That's despite the fact that he's shooting hot ass from three. He's shooting 29% from three, but his efficiency has actually gone up. And that's also despite the fact that he's not getting to the line. Um, you know, that's actually a good sign, right? What do you think, Sean? So, again, I know these are small samples and you shouldn't do this. I'm going to do it because it's my podcast, so fuck it. Um, you're the numbers guy. You can tell me how wrong this is. If you take away that Memphis game, which was like, I think we might have talked about this, and I'm pretty sure Jeff we talked about this, but like that that is that was to me the worst game of his career. Like that was it was so bad in the most annoying ways possible. It was terrible. First game of the year. After that point, RJ Barrett, okay, these are just his numbers in the nine games since. And this includes games where I thought he didn't particularly play well. He's averaging 20.6 20, 20. points, 5.6 rebounds, 2.9 assists in 35 minutes a night, shooting 46% from the field, 32.7 from three on 5.8 attempts, 81.1% from the free throw line on just 4.1 attempts per game, 56 true shooting, 52 EFG. Those are career numbers for him. That EFG is beautiful. Uh, if he's hitting, if, if the threes come around, that's going to be great. Also worth noting, uh, RJ right now shooting a career best on twos, 50.5% on twos for the year. Like this is, I mean, this is, if it holds up, this is stuff that it vaults him into a different conversation. And now you're not just talking about like, okay, can he just be like a solid rotation player? But now you're talking about like, okay, can he be the third best player in a title team? Okay, now if he's a third best player in a title team, can he get the second best player in a title team? Can he be Jalen you know, Brown? You know? Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, I, and I've always thought that he does have that potential, and like, that's why the passing is so important because the passing is a way for him to increase his offensive value in ways that go beyond just being a more efficient scorer. Um, and like, the finishing. He's never going to be the craftiest finisher or the most aesthetically pleasing finisher, that's for sure. He doesn't need to be. He's built like a brick shit house. And that's why that Celtics game was so encouraging to me because there were multiple drives in that game against bigger players where he just big he just bullied them. He just absolutely bullied them under the rim, created separation and got an easy layup. And like yes, I know Horford didn't play and Robert Williams is out, but like he he wouldn't have been able to do that last year. He wouldn't have even even in a game where he had an advantage, like like where there was no rim protection. He he was he's so much more under control right now, and I still don't think it's great yet. Like I think he's just, I think he is still improving and figuring it out and seeing it. And you're starting to see it on a game by game basis right now, uh, where there are like these small increment uh, or incremental, I should say, improvements. And it's just like. Yeah, I mean, the, again, the, the the stuff off the drive and, and all these things are great. And like, I, I don't know, I, I'm I'm cautiously very excited by what I've seen so far from him. Uh, he's like, again, if you just before this year, I mean, this really needs to be driven home. Before this year, he shot career over three seasons, forty four and a half percent from two. This year, fifty and a half percent from two. Like that is an improvement if it holds along with the free throw shooting, you're talking about a league average or slightly above league average volume scorer on the wing. That's a player that adds dimensions to your team and opens up possibilities. Like, and I got to say this, I really like, I don't know what it is. I can't 
exactly define it. I can't exactly, you know, label it appropriately or whatever. But like him and Cam just play well off of each other. And I think that helps him a lot. Like I think in a vacuum, Quickly is a better player than Cam. But like basketball doesn't exist in a vacuum. And regardless of how much I love Quickly, RJ in and rightfully so is a higher organizational priority. And if he's going to play well with Cam, then Cam needs to just keep playing and play a lot. Yeah, because it's, it's also well, like, well, what's it's like the, a great uh, what's slot what's receiver important? against, like if you have a 6'4 yeah. fade threat who is not as good as like Wes Welker or something, right? Yeah. Or like a great slot receiver, but like he makes the offense, like he demands a double team like that, right? And this is not the perfect analogy. Then yeah, and also like, like RJ playing with Cam. Also, by the way, I think that's gives Brunson Jeff helps Brunson a lot. It helps Brunson. What I was going to say is Jeff. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too. I think it makes Tibbs more comfortable with that Obi Randall frontline lineup. Yeah, First definitely. Time. Because you have that extra RJ is now the two, right? You have you have all that length, so the lack of rim protection matters less. Um, so I think that helps. And like I, we saw that sub yesterday, and that was like one of the few times where he's taken quickly out in the fourth quarter when quickly's having a good game. And I was like, you know what? And I thought he's going to put Evan in. I saw it because quickly got beat by Russell, and I was like, that was a tough beat. And I was like, fuck, he's taken quickly out. And then I saw Cam come in. And I was like, all right, well, I kind of get this, you know. But also, what's the uh, what's the meme you're always using, Stacy? Uh... It's like some Spanish meme. It's like why, not, but the whole bit is why not both? Those? Yeah, why, why not? Like, when I feel like the next step for Tibbs is trying RJ and Cam at the wings with a center, and like, like Brunson quickly. RJ Cam Mitch is a lineup I'm very interested in seeing. Yeah, or well, I think more, I think you're just gonna have to. I think you're just gonna have to be very interested in seeing it, and uh, that might be the closest <laughs> you get. But no, I look. I no. I, okay, I, okay, I, okay. Then then uh, then quickly then then quickly in Brunson's spot, and then with quickly with the starters when yeah, Rose I, gets his when Rose gets his injury, and quick, <laughs> like you're ta- you're talking. I mean, it's gonna happen. Then RJ then RJ needs to show more as a primary ball handler because quickly like he hasn't shown enough where like. I love him with another ball handler who can prove that. Second half of last year when RJ was that guy, they played amazing together. I love quickly with Brunson. Without Brunson right now, just how he's playing, I, I like because he he still can't beat guys without a screen. Like that's just the he struggles to get separation consistently. Like that's that's kind of the hesitation I have there. I love him with another the hesitation handler. in terms of what I mean, this is, I think the this, offense is, just, this, is, this right? is just right. But this is just a fundamental different di- disagreement I have with a lot of Nick's with Nick's fans in general. If you, if you make quickly the backup point guard and you give him minutes with those guys and, and he's just seeing more minutes, I firmly believe that one, he's going to get better at that stuff. And two, it's just in the best interest of the franchise. So I'm not saying that what you just said isn't right, but that doesn't mean that can I, it's can I not tell you the my, long-term like, best decision. Can I tell you my like ideal growth path for Emmanuel quickly? You can. So, Schwinn, who is the comp I've mentioned most for quickly on this pod? Uh, Michael Jordan. <laughs> Seriously? No, uh, Fred Van Vliet, right? Yeah. That is the path. So first of all, Fred Ramsey didn't come into the league until he was, what, 23, 22, 20. So like the age quickly is now. And even then, he played a lot with Lowry, and he kind of scaled up to what he's doing. And it was the perfect balance, right? I don't necessarily want quickly to have to – because the thing is, like, Jeff, I agree with a lot of what you're saying, but the risk is when he plays with Randall and RJ that he does defer too much, right? Like, ironically, he actually defers less, I think, when he plays next to Brunson or Rose because those are passers. They, like, will get him the ball. So I think that when he's just the guy, he's more likely to bring it up, feed Randall the post, and then go to the corner, right? Or, like, let RJ do some shit out of the pistol. And that's where, like, I think, like, I would rather have that balance. Now, does that mean he should never play with the starting lineup? No. But, um... But that's kind of like that is how I see his development path is like playing next to another ball handler, but getting ball handling opportunities. And then slowly you take the training wheels off. I don't know that he's like 
Fred Wynn didn't get the training wheels taken off until age 25. And I think that's eventually where quickly will end up. Yeah. But uh, it's, 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 first of all, it, it's, it's about volume versus rate because as long as Rose exists and as long as Thibodeau is the coach with how he substitutes, we're talking about meaningful volume minutes that quickly is missing out on. If we pigeonhole him as just a combo guard who needs to be next to Rose or Brunson. He's never going to play more than 20 minutes a game ever. It's just not going to happen. And so, I think specifically we should mention like either you have to take the Rose away from Tibbs or you take the Tibbs away from Rose. Like it has to be one of those things in the front office. This And, and I'm, at this point I'm more critical of the front office for this stuff than Tibbs because Tibbs is a known quantity. Like, and, and, and let's be real. Let's, let's give some credit to Tibbs. Tibbs has done things this year that he's not done in the past and have circumstances forced his hand. Maybe. Yeah, sure. You can say that, but if we're going to shit on him when he doesn't try things, even when the circumstances suggest he should, then we can't also not give him the credit for when he does do those things, you know? Um, And like, I don't want to, we've talked a lot about quickly. I don't want to belabor that point too much. Uh, But like, I do want to go back to the Philly game because this was you know, have you, you guys have seen Apollo 13? You know, we're like at the end where they're like, you know, the 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 ships would re-enter Earth's surface and the guy's like they're whispering in the back and he's like, Oh yeah, this could be a disaster for NASA. And Ed Harris is like, I think this is gonna be our finest hour. Like this was I Tibbs. They were saying, Hey little mama, let me whisper in here. Tell no, me that you okay. was you no, no, hit. we're not gonna do that. No, we're not gonna be yin yang twins here. Uh no, but like I thought this was I thought that was Tibbs' finest hour. Like the entire game was, it was a very annoying game because like he was trying to play 11 guys and he was also just clearly fucking around trying to find shit to the point where like, it felt like no group could get into a rhythm. But, and, and the, and the other thing that was weird about it was Cam was awesome in the first half, but then he just didn't go back to him until like what 10 30 left in the fourth quarter. Right. And he finally goes back to him, but then he he didn't just go back to him. He plays him in this fucking lineup with Randall and Obi at the four and five. And that group is like that game was not just, I don't want to say it was a revelation, but it was just like, it was really Tibbs' finest hour to me because he, he tried things that we know for sure he's not comfortable trying. And yes, it was a depleted Philly team and the matchups were favorable, but we've seen him in those situations still not do it and he did it and he was rewarded for it which you hope like look it was frustrating that he again played ob only 15 minutes against boston and like these are annoying things but if he can temper that with the stuff we saw like yesterday in mill in in minnesota which shows that like he's at least showing some willingness to try this you know as we talked about that rj cam ob randall look which is like small but it's not really small. You know what I mean? Like it's it's a pretty long group and they have good size, three, four, five, even at the two, right? RJ's a big two. Kind of hide Brunson. And like, not only is it great because it gets Obi on the floor and you get Reddish on the floor too. I've been as critical of Randall as anybody and I, I'm not inspired by what I saw yesterday because I don't think he's going to shoot eight of 13 from three shooting fucking, what did he had like six step back threes yesterday? I'm not, I'm not buying that's sustainable, but like what I can say for sure for him and Brunson is they are weapons in that group and it opens up the floor for them and you see different players. And I think uh, Stacy, you had mentioned earlier defensively that you thought Randall did more in that group and that might be true, but I thought offensively, I mean, in that fourth quarter in Philly, he couldn't have played a more annoying first three quarters than he did. And in that fourth quarter, Julius was all of a sudden like, this Draymond maestro at the five, like short roll, kicking out to shooters, all kinds of stuff. It was great in that fourth quarter. And you saw at the end of that game, they couldn't, nobody can stay in front of Brunson and keep him out of the paint. If you play five out, there isn't a soul. He is going to get in the paint. He's going to get off a quality shot. And he destroyed Philly down the stretch. They couldn't stop him. They could not do anything with him. Like Tibbs deserves a lot of credit for that. And I think very specifically, as you mentioned, Because of Cam's size, I think he is starting to feel like, okay, maybe I can try this a little bit more because Cam's a big dude and and you're switching things and it's like 
you're really only hiding one defender there. That's not to say Randall is a good defender, but you're not necessarily hiding him in that group, right? You know what I mean? So um, I don't know. I, I, I wanted to mention that game because I think we talked a shit ton about this last game, but I thought we needed to go back to the weekend because there were more than a few things in the weekend that I, I really liked. Um, and that Philly game definitely comes to mind. And then just shout out real quick, Hartenstein played like 40 minutes in that Boston game, which was insane because of the pace of it. So shout out to him for apparently just having an amazing motor. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to touch on that Philly fourth quarter because it was fucking great. It was awesome. And speaking I mean, of Philly fourth quarters, by the way, the Eagles are eight and zero. I just wanted to throw that out there. Nobody cares. Fuck Philadelphia. <laughs> no, they, they people care. Nobody cares. We'll see. I promise you, you if you make it there, if you make I don't know, the Jets might stop you, but if you make it there, we'd love to see the Bills and Yeah, you know, if you guys played in a real conference and you represented a real city with a real fan base that wasn't full of degenerate fucking scum. Cry guys, more, baby. Cry more. Cry nobody more. cares. This is a New York podcast. We're not talking about the fucking Philadelphia Eagles on here. Jeff, go ahead. We're not talking about almost Canada either. <laughs> we oh, were. Sorry, Jeff. Um, All right. <laughs> um, the fourth quarter was awesome, and it it just made it more frustrating that we hadn't seen this sooner. I mean, I don't know. I hate to. I, I felt this way after the Timberwolves game. Like, I, it's gonna take for me. I'll, I'm not gonna say like like not that he gives a shit about my forgiveness. And I, it's not even forgives name the right word, but just like trust that Thibodeau. Well, I mean, he might give. Like, we've been these... told today that. Schwinney is apparently the reason that teams aren't <laughs> that players don't want to sign with the Knicks. That was so. such that was so and also apparently, <laughs> oh, we give her we we give ourselves credit for influencing rotation decisions. I was like, we do that? Do we do we yeah. do that? We <laughs> don't, but there's people out there who said quickly started to pass the ball to Cam because of Twitter. Sorry, Jeff. I, I that was No, you're comment. good. Um I, I just think we're gonna need to see more diversity of rotations guys playing with different guys and then we're going to see need to see what happens when grimes and more importantly mitch come back because that's not an easy thing to do for a a really good coach or really like like a Ty Lue type who like i'd be curious to see how Ty Lue managed games last year when zubats hartenstein and their small lineup played what 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 the splits were like because he's really good at that stuff but it's it's a hard thing to do and then you throw in Tibbs is always like falling back on his you know his safety blankets he loves having a true center in there and I'll be very curious to see what happens when Mitch comes back because I think it'll be really bad for him if this is just a short-term fix and when Mitch comes back, it's 48 minutes a night of Mitch and Hardenstein and Obi's back to playing, you know, 15 minutes a night. I, I don't think that's a tenable solution for him. Um, so, I mean, I, I hate to be like, you know, I, I know you're trying to bring it, t- talk just about the Philly game and I'm always such a fucking Debbie Downer, big picture guy. The Philly game was awesome. It was awesome in the moment. It was probably the most excited I've been as a Knicks fan since RJ hit the game winner. I was like openly like yelling at the TV, like let's fucking go and like fist pumping that Philly game was awesome. And if I was even close to hundred percent sure that it meant real change was coming, I would be much more excited. I'm just a little skeptical. The scars of last season are too fresh and too deep. So those are my thoughts on the Philly game. Yeah, I mean, I, I what I'd add to that, so the reason I was more encouraged by the Philly game was, I think, you know, Schwinn kind of mentioned this, but he said, you know, in one of his post games, I think it was the game before the Philly game, right? It was, uh, it was like Cleveland. Um, he said that, no, it was Atlanta. Um, that So the Atlanta was kind of the low point of the season for me. Um, I oh, was at God. that game. Um, just blowing a 23. That to me was the game that it felt like everything was just the same. It was, had had been, you know, no adjustments when the lead was going down a lackadaisical approach. Once they had the lead, all of the things that we hate about what happened last year. And, um, what was interesting was in the post game, they asked him, why didn't you go back to Mitch? And he said, well, we were searching 
And I think people took that as like, oh my God, we're really fucked, right? And um, I actually took that as kind of a positive quote, even at that time. Because yes, we've wanted him to search. This is a lineup with a lot of searchability, or a team with a roster with a lot of searchability. And, um, you know, he's just, um, he's, he was starting to do that. So I think that, I think he's really at a point where he's like, yeah, like we have a lot of good players and the quote unquote, you know, maybe conventional wisdom lineups don't work as well. And he was trying new things and he went back to, he went back to Obi and, and, um, and, and Randall again, um, he played cam, he closed with cam again. I don't think these are coincidences. I don't know if it means that he's going to, I think he still wants to hammer out a 10 man rotation, but he's been willing to play 11 and 12 guys for the minute, just to at least see things. Maybe we see like a deuce, you know, um, outing if, if there's like a guard who's causing the Knicks a lot of trouble. But um, but even like that quote even and like what he's followed up with was a little bit encouraging to me. I, I just want to say to that to the point you just made, I actually think it would be in the Knicks' best interest to go the other way and cut it down to a nine man rotation even when even when Mitch comes back. If they go to um if they just remove Fournier from the rotation and just go even if you want to keep Rose in the rotation and you go with the current starting lineup. Um, well, I guess Rose would have to come out of the rotation. So I guess, I don't know, we're going to disagree here because you, you, you think Rose, you know, is necessary next quickly, which is fine, but no, I, I didn't, I don't know if I said all that. Uh, I gotta re I gotta clean up what I said there. I, I think but, that it gets solved by Fournier trade, but anyway, go ahead. let's just say hypothetically you're comfortable with quickly as the backup point guard or just soaking up, you know, playing next to Brunson some and playing, next to Grimes some, so he's kind of doing both, which I think is kind of what you were trying to say. I think, to me, that's the ideal role for him, but whatever. This isn't about quickly. It's about the team. If if they go to a nine-man rotation of the starting lineup with Mitch and then um, quickly Grimes, Obi, uh, Hardenstein, that is the path to not only getting the best out of this team this current team because all nine guys will be playing more will be more locked in but also to getting the most possible combinations because you can't do simple x for x swaps positionally it forces you to say okay these are my starters but i'm gonna keep these guys on a constant rotating loop you get more combinations of lineups you get different looks it forces tibbs hands in hand in terms of diversification of lineups and just throwing the other team, diff throwing different looks at the opposition. So I just want to say that, you know, you were saying 11 or 12, I actually think a nine man rotation is optimal for the Knicks current uh, iteration. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I think nine, definitely a nine man rotation right now would be what I would do until Brian gets back. Um, and I'm fine with Rose playing by the way, like he, is to me cooked like he's and I I say that in the way that like he's just not going to be able to consistently do the stuff that we got accustomed to the last couple of years when he was healthy but like I, I I know it's bizarre to say this after he shot like what is he one of 10 yesterday and missed just was so far off on a few open ones so it was RJ weirdly he airballed like two pretty decent three-point looks it was a very odd game um but like I buy the shooting with Rose I think he's good as a shooter still so I'm cool with that and like he occasionally still has some juice off the bounce, so whatever. I also just like having him around. Like it seems like the young guys respect him. I do think that you need an older head in the locker room. He obviously still has a lot of gravitas around the league, so like I think it's good to have that. It's also good to have somebody who is especially like it's funny because we just talked about like Tibbs or Rose, one of these guys have to go. But it's good to have a player who can kind of be a conduit from the coach to the players and vice versa. Uh, which I do think Rose serves as, so I think there's value there. Yeah, Randall actually referenced that in his post game interview. If you heard that, uh, I yesterday. make it a point to not make myself angry by listening to Julius Randall post game interviews. Uh, <laughs> no, that's that's good yeah. to hear. I, that's good to hear. Yeah, he um, said he shot so many threes because Rose is like, "Yo, Tibbs has given us the green light. Like, let's let him. Let's let him go." Yeah, that's good. I mean, uh, genuinely, I mean that. That's good. 
if there's any Randall stands out there that are listening to DLME. Um, but like, uh, like Fournier just, he's doing nothing out there on either end of the floor. Looks terrible, making consistently bad decisions. Don't need his minutes. And then when Grimes gets back, you put him in, in that role. I think this team is pretty close to like the best version of it that you could expect with Tibbs. I don't know how we got here. It's been a hell of a ride getting Reddish into the starting lineup somehow uh, after it felt like there was no path to him even playing. But it seems like we're here, and I'm fairly confident that when Grimes, whenever he's healthy, if he's healthy, that Fournier will be out. So until then, I think the major annoyances will be Fournier still getting minutes and Randall. Playing. It feels like an Austin Rivers type situation, right? A little bit. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um Rivers, Kemba, it's kind of going down that path. And, you know, we'll see how it goes. Obviously, he's a different level of salary, and that's its own complication that the front office needs to manage. But, like, again, if Tibbs gets to the point where we're talking about where Grimes is that 10th guy, look, we can sit here and bitch about, like, Obi's not getting enough minutes, quickly he's not getting enough minutes, this thing, that thing. You'd have to say that you ended up in a pretty good place, as good a place as you could have with Tibbs, and that he's given... He's, he's done a little give and take here, you know? Um, he's been a little more flexible. You have to give him that credit. And I can't believe, especially after that Hawks game, because I was, after that, I mean, I, I still think, like, you're probably better off firing Tibbs and moving on. But, like, he's actually shown flexibility since then and growth since then, which is a, very meaningful to me and makes me more open-minded about keeping him. Um, but, like, now it's on the front office. All this stuff to me is on the front office. All, you know, like I can sit here and bitch about Mitch all I want, but like that's on the front office to figure out, right? If that's how you're going to get OB 25 minutes a night, so be it. Like, or if you want to consolidate in a different position, or if you want, like, all this stuff is for the front office to solve. Uh, so I guess somehow I reached a place where like I'm a Tibbs fan, but no, like, I, I'm, but like, I'm, I have to give the man credit. Like he has really shown flexibility over the last week that I did not have faith that he could, that he would show. And he has, he deserves credit for it. And I think the Knicks are starting. I think they're very close to maybe going on a little run here. Like this is a good team. Kevin Durant's probably going to drop 70 on us tomorrow because he like absolutely hates the Knicks for some reason. Um, But like, this is a good team. I think this defense is going to pick up as we go along, uh, those rotations won't stay a mess. They will clean up. I buy the rim protection. I think the boxing out defense, all that stuff will get better. And I think this offense is, I think they're really just touching the surface of what they can do. Like there's way more. And I got to say, we, we haven't even talked about Brunson at all. Uh, and I do have to, I have to get going a little bit, but like before we finish up, Jalen Brunson's awesome. He's averaging basically 27 and four right now on 58 and a half true shooting. He's shooting, what is it, 50, just under 51% from the field, 57% from two. He's not even shooting well from three yet. Like, this guy, the Knicks got a fucking bargain on that contract. Absolute bargain. He is, I don't know if he's an all-star, but he he's in that mix. He, he is in the mix. He's in the conversation to be an all-star this year in the Eastern Conference for sure. Un, undoubtedly. He's been amazing. And he's... I mean, we talked about this when um, after the Memphis game, I think, was that we did it. Me and you did a podcast together, I think, after the Memphis game. The way he scores is just such a stabilizer in the way the Knicks have never had. Um, not never. Haven't had since, like, Deke Mello. Um, it's, it's just really quick. Like, this is a reason why I thought, like, somebody like LaMarcus Aldridge or Dirk Nowitzki – probably the better example because he's a better player. Like people are like, oh, mid range, you know, not the most efficient shot. But like if you're a 50% mid range shooter, you can get that shot almost anytime you want. And if you're getting 50% shots at the end of games, that is worth that's worth its weight in gold. It, it is it is literally gold in the NBA to get a 50% shot in crunch time in the NBA. Yeah, we that was that was the right. exact thing we talked about on that pod is the Mavs over Dirk's, you know, 10, 15 year peak were like 20 games above Pythag. And the reason they did that is because they weren't running hot. It's 
they have a better end of game offense and a more sustainable better end of game offense because median is more important than ceiling sometimes more important than points per possession or point EV Jalen Brunson getting a two point shot at the end of these close games is more valuable than, you know, a 33% shooter shooting a three. It just is, even if the points per possession is roughly similar because you want to, you need more consistent output. Um, It just helps you win. And that's what he's bringing to the Knicks. And that's, they did not, they, I mean, they had the opposite of that last year. It was extremely volatile and extremely uncountable. Uh, you couldn't count on it. Um, unreliable. And yeah, he's just been amazing. I, I do agree with Stacy, by the way, with what he said at the beginning of this pod. I think we're all so enamored with this shiny new toy that we're not really giving enough credence to just how bad his defense has been. I've seen people who... I respect being like, oh, he tries hard on defense and he does try hard sometimes and he does take charges, but he's been worse than Knicks fans are talking about. And I think he's better than he's been on defense. And I look forward to that turning around. I hope very much it turns around because I don't think he's been very good defensively. Just that real, yeah. Just, just real quick on the defense. I think, um, I think the effort has been there most of the time, but when he it's not there, it's pretty ugly. I think a lot of his mess ups on defense. It looks to me like he's executing what Dallas was doing last year. Like his brain defaults to that sometimes instead of what the Knicks are doing. You see this all the time. He's messed up this wing screen and roll thing. Like it's not even a wing screen roll, just a wing screen to to try and draw a switch. And he's the Knicks don't switch that. He's switching it. And so it always ends up leaving a wide open three for the guy, the ball handler if he keeps it. He's done this like like five or six times. I wish I could clip it. I'm not describing it maybe properly, but like it's like when you, the ball handler brings the ball up, somebody on the wing sets a screen for them, and he goes to switch it instead of fighting over to stay with his man, which is what the Knicks do. And like he doesn't. And so I think he's just defaulting sometimes to what they were doing in Dallas, but I do think he'll pick it up defensively. And I agree, he needs to pick it up defensively. But it's very obvious to me he's the best player on the team. And that is what you were paying for. That's what you were hoping for. And there are times where I want him to exert that dominance a little bit more and not just like give the ball to Randall because Randall's asking for it, or RJ for that matter, or anybody. Uh, he, like, he had a possession yesterday where he kind of like gave the ball to quickly and let him do things. And I'm like, no, dude, like this is your time. Like, like I'm happy to get <laughs> to have Emmanuel quickly initiate reps, but I'm pretty sure Tibbs brought you back in to like close this game out. So please close the game out. And he did after that. But like, yeah, he's just, he, like you said, stabilizing force, super efficient scorer. He is giving the Knicks this consistency that the, like we, I, we all love uh, quickly. I think, you know, all of us, consistency has not been his hallmark offensively, right? Consistent as a decision maker, defender, whatever, but that scoring element is not consistent. Brunson is a metronome. That dude is a metronome. He is going to give you, like, that 27 and 4, that's not like a week of 30 and 10 and, you know, it's it's 27 and 4. Like, it is that every single night, basically. It's super helpful to a coach. Tibbs, obviously, in this case, or and anybody on the on the roster to know what you're getting every single night from that position. So uh, the front office, you know, they have a lot of shit they still need to do, and I've been very critical of them lately. But like, they deserve a ton of credit for that signing, um, making that happen. And I think I think they also deserve credit for the Hartenstein signing, which has shown, like, because Mitch is absent, we are seeing we don't need to do the debate of should Hartenstein start or not. But like, that is a value signing you're seeing what he adds to the team that you didn't get from that position before, which is, by the way, it's not just stretch. Like, he's not a stretch big, and that's fine because he still gives you stuff that you didn't have before. Um, but yeah, they, those both those signings, they deserve credit for. They've, been, they've kind of proven their worth early on this season already. Uh, Stacey, anything that you want to mention before we get out of here? No, good. All right, that is our pod for today. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, Frank? a.k.a. Jeffrey Rasmussen, your actual name. Uh, let people know where they can find you and plug anything that you'd like to plug. Um, I'm at Frank Barrett 119 on Twitter. Um, 
read the Strickland. I just recapped today's game, which was fine. You know, read it, don't read it. Uh, I've got a uh, I've got a column coming out for the Strickland, hopefully this week or next week. Um, I'm not going to spoil the idea, but I think it's pretty cool. So yeah, just keep up with everything Strickland. I think we're doing a lot of good work. Obviously, I'm biased, but yeah. Awesome, man. Looking forward to that. And uh, yeah, check out the rundown that uh, Jeff is on with Sam and unfortunately Tyrese after each game. It's fun. They do good stuff. Uh, it also gets un- dropped in podcast form the day after if you have, if you miss it post game. Uh, Jeff, again, thank you so much for coming on. Stacy, let the people know where they can find you and plug anything that you would like to plug. Um, it's Stacy Patton 89. I will also plug some Strickland content, but specifically. We should have a preliminary roundtable. Uh, Prez is running that on the 2023 draft. Um, even if you don't want the Knicks to tank, there will be a lot of interesting prospects, uh, even uh, in the middle range, uh, and the Knicks have multiple picks. Um, Schwinn, if you are at all watching Michigan basketball, I highly recommend watching Jet Howard. Both because he's awesome, but also because that may be a player who is available in the mid to late round who could be really good for the Knicks as a long, rangy wing who can shoot the ball. So I'll plug that article, check that roundtable out, as well as Jet Howard. Go Blue, it is election day, so this is a, a double entendre on that Go Blue. So Yeah, hopefully by the time this pod drops, um, Blue will have one out. Uh, all right. That is our podcast today. I have nothing to plug, so I'm just going to plug all the wonderful Wicked Strickland that we do uh, and all of that good stuff. Check out our merchandise. It's fun. It's good. Uh, yeah, that is our pod for today. I hope everybody has a great week, and I will see you on Friday.